Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Hey now. What's up, everybody? How you doing? Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. That's right. Today's Tuesday, March 29th, 88 days of the new year, 276 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And we need to be because it's hailing outside like real hail. I got pictures. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet, I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? What is cracking? we got some strange weather going on. Hail in Burbank. Crazy. All right. Tonight is night two of the secret space program breakaway civilization week here on Fade to Black. It's better than Shark Week. It is too, isn't it? It's pretty cool. Last night, Corey Good. Tonight, Joseph P. Farrell. The one and only is with us. And then tomorrow night, Richard Dolan is going to be here. What a week on the show. Let's get our learn on. Some education is happening here on Fade to Black. And uh, I was talking to Joseph earlier tonight. And yes, we are going to be taking some phone calls. So we will do that in the last segment. 323-825-5045. All right, great phone calls last night, great show last night. And then don't forget that starting this Thursday, John Rappaport will be here every Thursday. This Thursday will be the premiere of No More Fake Newsroom. That's right. He's going to have 30 minutes at the front of every fader night to bring it like nobody else can. Rappaport. Man alive. Now, if you go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, there's a news tab at the top of the page. You can go and click on it, and uh, there is uh, John's new page. Very, very excited about this. It's a big deal. I almost feel legit. You know, you bring somebody on like John and, uh, you know, and do this. It's, wow. Wow. I feel like we've arrived And uh, there you go. Very excited. And uh, now let's just uh, run through everything and uh, and then get this show started. As as I say at the front of every show, it's so important. Our sponsors, you need to support our sponsors. You support the sponsors. You support the show. That's how this show happens. That's how we roll. That's that's America, the American way. (laughs) That's how it works. Advertising. That's how it works. Support our sponsors. Support the show. And with Life Change Tea, all you're doing is helping yourself. So it's a win-win. Life Change Tea. Get the tea.com. The banners are right there at Jimmy Church Radio. Click.
click on it. Go and do it. Right now, the special is order two months of the Super Strength Tea, and you get a bottle of Moringa for just 5 bucks, and you get free shipping when you use the promo code JIMMY. That's all you got to do. Help yourself. Help the show. Feel better. That's what you do. Okay? And the new Studio Dome special uh, that they've got for the Fader Knots is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And and I love music. It's Music makes the world go around. That's, that's the way it works, right? This system is two SBB2 new technology speakers. They are gnarly, man. Gnarly. And you get two of them with true wireless stereo. So you got a portable hi-fi system to take your Van Halen on the go. You're at the park, you're on the back patio, you're at the beach, you're camping, you're out cliff diving, and you've got your Van Halen in in full high fidelity stereo for just $129. And you get a hard shell case. It is a gnarly system, dude. Go click on the banner for Studio Dome at Jimmy Church Radio. Support the show. Go do it. It's amazing. You'll be so glad that you did. All right. Our our summer schedule is up on the website. I was just uh, right before the show, um, I was over in Rita's studio and looking at the website. And, I, you know, I got to tell you, I cannot believe. Uh, that that website looks as good as it does because it's 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 amazing, and uh, everybody's done a lot of hard work on it. And so you can go now. Uh, John Rappaport's page is up, so you can go and check that out. But I don't think there's a better website out there. I really don't. I don't care who 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 you point at. We uh, we have got something really to be proud of, and our full summer schedule is up and posted. And uh, the new Living Expo, which is coming up in in April, is rapidly closing in here because we're we're almost at April Fool's Day. Wow! Wait! 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 April Fool's Day is oh, we miss it. That's Friday. I was hoping it was going to be Fader Night. <laughs> oh man, that that'd be great. Let's get the show cracking today. One of my favorites. Brendan Gleason is 61. And uh, he, you know what? No matter what, for the rest of his life, he's got one thing in his back pocket. Lake Placid. He was good in Gangs of New York. He was good in, 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 in Burgess. You know, how do they say that? In Burgess. Mission Impossible, he was cool. Troy, he was really good. 28 days later. But no. It's Lake Placid. It's Lake Placid for him. Perry Farrell today is 57. And Eric Idle is 73. Happy birthday, everyone. All right. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Simple enough. Go and do it. The sandbox is hashtag F2B. If you don't have Tweet Deck, get it. You need Tweet Deck. You do. If you don't have Tweet Deck and you haven't. Listen, if you're listening to me right now, right, and and you're you're settling into the show, and you hear us talk about the sandbox, and you hear me talk about Twitter, it's it's important for you to understand what what I'm trying to say here, okay? Tweet deck, tweet deck. Go to Twitter and download tweet deck. It's a Twitter product. That's what you need for Twitter. You'll never tweet again. Without TweetDeck, it's what Twitter's supposed to be. In fact, they should just get rid of Twitter altogether and only have TweetDeck. Your life would be so much easier and simpler. But that's what you need to do. Go and get TweetDeck. And then once you do, and you need to figure out how how to do things, come hang out with us. And somebody in the sandbox, somebody over here, will help you along, and then that's it. And you only need a few minutes. And then you can just run side-by-side with the show. It's amazing. Tweet Deck is it. All right. Now now I'm off of my soapbox and getting back into the sandbox. Hashtag F2B. (coughs) 
Mm. Wow, that came out of nowhere. It's hail. I'm blaming it on the hail. And and oh, you know what? I'll get to this in just a second. Uh, uh, tonight, Joseph P. Farrell. Tomorrow night, Richard Dolan. Thursday night, John Rappaport with the premiere of NoMoreFakeNewsroom.com. And then, Fader Night. Open lines all night long. On this day in history, in 2006, Queen Elizabeth II made Tom Jones, you know, Tom Jones, the Sir Tom Jones. That's right. He was knighted. He was made a knight commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. I did not know that. Sir Tom Jones. Sir She's a lady, Tom Jones. Yeah, sir, it's not unusual, Tom Jones. Did you guys ever see Mars Attacks, Tom Jones? And that that scene where he's coming out, you know, when the Martians attack. But he comes out with his, you know, and he's uh, uh, performing. That version, you can get that track on the Mars Attacks soundtrack. Because it's one of the best versions of, uh, I think that's, she's a lady, right? Really cool. Fader fact. The demilitarized zone in North and South Korea is actually the world's most militarized zone. And that is a fader fact. All right. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk really quick. I don't. I don't have a long rant tonight, but I have a real one. And uh, and it's, it's about the weather. Here in Southern California, uh, we live in a desert. And if, if Mulholland hadn't had constructed the aqueducts that come in off of the mountains here, there would be no water. You... If you haven't seen the movie Chinatown with Jack Nicholson, go and watch it because that's exactly uh, the story (laughs) and the corruption behind it, uh, by the way. But we live in a desert here. And if it wasn't for the aqueducts and if it wasn't for the snow melt, uh, the snowpack, and drawing that water in, it's all done by gravity. It's a brilliant design. Uh, bringing water down here, there would be no Southern California. There would be no movie industry. There would be no Los Angeles. Uh, there would be nothing here because it's a desert. So what is here is a frigging desert. And we are trying to make it not a desert. Now, I did a, I did a report last week about the cloud seeding that is going on right now actively here in Southern California, right behind the studio, right here at the base of the mountains. They have 10 cloud seeding stations installed, and they kicked them off. Now, all of a sudden, it's raining. Okay, so if you talk about harp and weather manipulation and chemtrails and if they are real and would they really do it? Well, they are. And that's a fact. I'm not wearing tinfoil. I'm not running around screaming about something imaginary. It's real. Okay, they are really manipulating the weather. And they have to because we live in a desert. And we are trying to change Mother Nature. We're trying to change Mother Earth. We're trying to change what is naturally here. Now, we've just gone through a multi-year drought, which I've gone through a few times here in Southern California since I moved here in 83, 84. The, The manipulation of the weather, is it a good thing? And if you are manipulating the weather here, because it's Mother Nature, does something else change somewhere else? You know, the butterfly effect, right? So if we change something here, does it change something in India? That's one idea. But does it change something in Arizona? Does it change something in Texas? Does it change something in Oregon, Portland? 
or New York or Maine or Detroit? Does it? We don't know. We just don't know. And I, until, because, and, and until we let a large amount of time pass and we learn, we don't know the after effects of doing this. And what I'm referring to is right now they're manipulating the weather here. And today, on March 29th, it hailed outside. Now, I got to tell you, why is that so dramatic? Well, yesterday, it was like, and the day before, it was 80 degrees. Beautiful outside, not a cloud in the sky. And then all of a sudden, yesterday, it was like a refrigerator, like it happened overnight. And today, I mean, cold, cold outside. This is Burbank. This is Los Angeles in April. I'm here to tell you, normally we're cracking, we're getting close to 90 degrees. And suddenly you walk outside and I swear it feels like, it doesn't feel right. It feels like you put your face in your freezer and you're looking for ice cream. You know, that really cold thing. That's what it feels like outside right now. It's trippy. It's like cold, not a winter cold. It's like an artificial cold. Like when you open up the refrigerator door, the freezer door, and it's not right. And it just hailed outside. It doesn't hail in California ever. Once in a while, you know how many times it's hailed since, since I've lived here? Like twice in 30 years, going on 40. Yeah. So it just hailed. Still, it's probably still hailing outside. And it's happening because they're cloud seeding. And they've changed the weather pattern here. What is the effect that this has everywhere else? There's no positive without a negative. That's the way, <laughs> that's the, way the world works, right? I equate it to the same mistakes that we have made with GMOs. You're messing with Mother Nature. When, and the, it, this is something serious. We don't know, and I think we're starting to find out now, 20 years later into this GMO program, that it's not the way to go. All right? You're messing with Mother Nature. Built in, I mean, uh, bug-resistant plants, bigger, stronger, better, seedless, and, and other things that they're manipulating into these. You know, bigger, bigger, better, faster, Right? uses less water. Everything is crazy what they're doing with GMOs. But we don't know the after effects. You know, two generations down the line, 50 years from now, you know, our children are being born with an arm sticking out of their forehead. How did we get here? And we can, we'll be able to go back to zero point day, the day that we introduced GMOs into wheat, into corn, into soy, the hormones that are being injected into unnaturally into, into our food system. This is Mother Nature that we're messing with. The planet ran just fine for four and a half billion years. And now this last 50, 50, last 40, 30 years, we've started to mess with Mother Nature. And I'm here to tell you, at one point, she's going to burp. She's going to vomit. We're going to push things just a little bit too far. I think we need to go back and just think about things a little bit. Mother Nature had a way of just making things right and balanced and okay. From animals and, and humans and, and fish and the oceans and what's going on top and what's going on underneath. Everything was in balance and just ran right. The polar ice caps, you know, are there for a reason. 
All of the ocean's tides are there for a reason. The seasons happen. Bee, bees pollinate. The monarch butterflies. The, the, the transitions of the birds every year. And the migrations of herds and things was all natural. Things did themselves for survival, for balance. Think about what I'm saying. And now we just want to come in and control the earth, something that we know nothing about. We haven't explored. We don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about our oceans. We know nothing, zero. We try to learn every day, but we know zero about it. There's so many places on planet Earth that no feet have ever been, nobody's ever walked on, we don't know about. We probably know more about our solar system and the galaxy than we do our own Earth. We've probably explored as much of the moon as we have our own oceans. And that's no joke. And now we suddenly have decided that we're smart enough to control things. The weather and, and, and the oceans, the clouds, the seeds, the animals, that we know what we're doing. And we're not that smart yet. It's a pretty shocking thing for me to uh, uh, sit there and, and have Rita come running through going, it's hailing outside. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, at the brink of summer, hailing in Burbank. When the day before it was 80, and now today it's a refrigerator outside, and we have hail. It doesn't make sense. It's not that. We live in a desert. It's crazy. Absolutely nuts. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know what we can do. As a collective, you know, I'm speaking to this audience right now. And I know that all of you hear me and understand exactly. You guys get it. You know, you do. But what can we do? We can't march on Washington and, and scream about GMOs and cloud seeding and weather manipulation. We can't do it. Who's going to listen? Congress doesn't know what's going on. They're afraid of the word chemtrail, right? They're afraid of the word Monsanto. You can't do it. I, I don't know. I, I really don't know how we pump the brakes on this. I really don't know. I don't know. All the websites in the world and all of the videos on YouTube you want to do, I'm not sure that there's anybody out there listening. We need to do something. All right. And that's, that's, see, that's, that's how my brain works. Some hail outside. And there are people, there are millions of people right now in Southern California that probably didn't even notice. Whatever. It hailed outside. Cool. Let's go take some pictures. Instagram, dude. Instagram. When it's much deeper than that. All right, let's get to all the news that you know nothing about. Police have made an arrest in the case of the flying saucer that was stolen from Roswell's International UFO Museum last week. They also say that they are still looking for two other suspects. Police say they were able to track down one of the thieves because of a phone call. The flying saucer that used to hang on the side of the museum was stolen while it was being stored behind the museum for repairs. The museum's security camera caught three people <laughs> loading the spaceship into the bed of a red pickup truck and then taking off. You can check out the video right now. I think we've got to post it over on Facebook. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on it. Not making it up, man. How? You don't do that. That's like stealing the Bob's Big Boy statue from the front of Bob's Big Boy. You don't take the flying saucer from the Roswell Museum. Can't do that. More than 250 years after Shakespeare's death, 
a story began to circulate that his skull had been stolen from his grave in Stratford-upon-Avon by trophy hunters. Now, for more than a century, the tale was widely dismissed as myth. But check this out. On the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death, archaeologists believe that they have found evidence that he is missing his head. That's right. Using ground-penetrating radar to scan the grave, they discovered that the skull is apparently absent. They also established that a skull in a church in Biole, 20 miles away, which according to local legend belonged to William, right? It, it belonged to Bill. And that skull, it turns out, was in fact from a 77-year-old woman. They've run all the tests. This means that Shakespeare's skull could still be at large somewhere. And that, <laughs> that is a crazy story. Unbelievable. Well, it wasn't happy hour for some of Central Florida's drivers when trucks carrying, oh man, this is when you are happy that you're a fade or not listening to this show right now. Because two trucks, one carrying Bush beer, they still sell Bush? I didn't know that. They still sell Bush? And Frito-Lay chips collided, spilling them both along Interstate 95. Florida Highway Patrol spokesman Kim Montez said in a statement that Zachary Bassinger of Melbourne had stopped his Frito-Lay box truck on the right shoulder of the freeway. Robert Ferrer Rodriguez of Miami told troopers he was trying to move his beer truck into the center lane but saw another vehicle and swerved back into the right lane when he crashed into the truck of chips. The Frito-Lay truck overturned and the beer and chips spilled onto the highway. Traffic was backed up for miles as people were getting their beer and chips while they cleared the debris. Rodriguez himself was ticketed for failing to maintain a single lane. You know, that's, that's really funny. That's really funny that in an incident like that where he swerved to avoid it, you know, he would have been cleared if he just stayed in his lane and plowed into the Frito-Lay truck. Then it's not his fault. You can't leave your lane. Isn't that funny? I always thought that was like some weird law. All right, let's get out of here. Let's get uh, Joseph P. Farrell in here. Day two of our secret space program, Breakaway Civilizations Week, right here on Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Follow me on Twitter, at Radio. Email is Jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Bespoke Radio for the masses. I'll be right back with Joseph P. Farrell. Stay right there. Listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. 
And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station, where the Fader Knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Welcome back to Fade to Black. The spoke radio for the masses. That's right. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight is night two of our Breakaway Civilization Secret Space Program week here on Fade to Black. And tonight, you know, one thing that we set out to do this week was bring the absolute very best three nights of this and it's and it's not enough tonight joseph p farrell is with us he is a recognized scholar whose credentials include a phd in philosophy from the university of oxford his literary contribution is a veritable resume unto itself covering such fields as nazi germany sacred literature physics finances the giza pyramids and music theory a renowned researcher with an eye to assimilate a tremendous amount of background material, Farrell is able to condense the best scholastic research in publication and draw insightful new conclusions on complex and controversial subjects. His books include, and there's a lot, but these are my favorites, The Giza Death Star, The Giza Death Star Deployed, Reich of the Black Sun, the Giza Death Star Destroyed, the SS Brotherhood of the Bell, the Cosmic War, that is a must read, Secrets of the Unified Field, and the Philosopher's Stone. His website is GizaDeathStar.com, and I'd like to welcome back to Fade to Black our good friend, Joseph P. Farrell. Joseph, good evening. Hey, Jimmy. Thanks for having me back. Man, I got to tell you, when it, the, the thing is, Joseph, with, with our audience there is certain required reading in our circle right and and for me the cosmic war is is just one of those books if you want to if you want to come hang out with us and you want to be able to jump into a conversation at the dinner table and and <laughs> act like you're in the know you know there's certain things that you just got to do man there is alternative history 101 right right and, and the cosmic war man 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right there. No, you know, you can just enjoy your drinks and food over there by yourself if you haven't read The Cosmic War. But if you want to jump in with us, you know, you know, and how does it feel to write a book like that? I mean, when you get to the end of it, uh, are you exhausted? It, it and and are you happy? And w- is there anything that you would have changed? Oh well, I tell people that uh, writing a book is as close as men will ever get to childbirth. When you're <laughs> when oh, you're right. done, when you're done, you're just glad the whole process is over. <laughs> so, so yeah, it 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 was. I, I was relieved to be done with that book, but I got to tell you, I deliberately conceived that book as kind of the keystone in the arch of all of my books. So yeah, it's it's a very um, crucial book. It's it's uh, it paints in very broad strokes. We'll just put it that way. Yeah, you're absolutely right uh, with that. It does kind of it's a spider web. Yeah, I, I could see that being at the center of uh, the feral universe. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, but the childbirth thing, <laughs> I, you know, I have said, Joseph, I've said many times, one of the things that I respect the most about authors is that they are authors. And 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 what do I mean by it's that I it's something that I don't think I could ever do. I don't know if I could have that kind of discipline. I really the the amount of time that it takes. Life is short, right? Yeah. yeah. And if you're going to commit a year or two or longer to making sure a book is perfect and and get it done, that is it's beyond where I can put my mind. I just can't I, I just have such mad respect for it. How many books have you authored so far? Uh right now in the field of, of alternative research, I've got about twenty three and the book at the publisher now, which will make it twenty four. So yeah. It's quite a few. Do you know how insane that sounds? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is insane because I got to tell you, all I do is get up and take care of the necessities. And then I, you know, spend the rest of the day in front of my computer reading books. But, so, yeah, it, it's it's a nonstop 24-7 uh, process, it seems like sometimes. When uh, when I think about this and and think about you and how you do your writing, what something happened to Joseph P. Farrell in your childhood? You know, something happened. <laughs> I don't know if it was a high fever, if uh, you know, if you had some friend that was influencing you, or you know, you saw something in the night sky. Something triggered this life of yours. What was it? Well, I I ascribe it to the fact that my father and a very good family friend of ours were both engineers. And they would get together every Friday night and play pitch. They'd play cards. And, you know, with two engineers at the table, inevitably the topic would turn to science or something. And I remember very vividly as a boy, they were playing pitch one night. And my dad and this other fellow started talking about the Great Pyramid. And, I, I, you know, that just kind of captivated me and fascinated me. And I, I ascribe part of it to that, but I've always had kind of this interest in alternative subjects and, and ancient texts and so on and so forth. So it, it kind of put me off in that direction from a very early age. And even when I was even when I was in the academic world, I still kept reading in it and, and studying it and so on and so forth. Before we, um, you know what? This is my show. Damn it! I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> um, before we get into uh, the secret space program and what is going on in breakaway civilizations, before we do that, I want to share with you uh, today, actually yesterday and today, I got a phone call from a friend, fellow researcher that is doing a television project and had questions for me in their research uh, about uh, some some background history on Gobekli Tepe and the Giza pyramids and, and Mesopotamia. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, wow, okay, that's an honor. I'm not the guy to talk to about this, but uh, sure. And But what was interesting here, Joseph, was that his uh, this network had approached him to to cover what is now starting to become mainstream. It, it, the, you know, this this missing history, the lost history, the construction, um, right. the BS that we've been fed behind it and and now jumping into this. And that really kind of flipped me out 
that this is now starting to, I can see, you know, Zahi Haiwas is losing his mind <laughs> because it is starting to become mainstream. This, yes. this alternative stuff that you have been screaming about and, 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 and others like you and myself you know, for years that this is now we're, I think there's a paradigm shift going on. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with you. It's very interesting because I just saw this very serious article now that has been released by some um, astronomers and, and, you know, exoplanetary archaeologists, if for want of a better expression, where they're talking about some of the moons of Saturn being younger than the dinosaurs right i saw that I, you saw that yes i did isn't that a trip <laughs> because because what what that is like it or not that's a paradigm changer right there that is a huge paradigm changer not only in terms of of the planetary physics and the history that they thought at one time was true but it, it's happening everywhere and and i agree with you i think something is happening in terms of of an actual paradigm change there's more and more people realizing that the standard stock and trade academic history of things just does not add up and you know the 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 basic testament of that is the fact that you look at civilizations like Egypt or Sumer and they just spring up whole cloth out of nowhere you know we're supposed to be hunting and gathering and making all this gradual evolutionary change to civilization you know domestication of animals and so on but what you see in the historical record isn't this gradual change it's a sudden eruption of, of civilization complete with mathematics and banking and loans and credit and astronomy and geometry and you know on and on it goes and they just spring up from nowhere and these civilizations in turn you examine the record and what they tell you is that they call themselves or refer to themselves as legacy civilizations of something much more ancient and much more sophisticated so yeah I think the paradigm is changing and it's high time you know people are beginning to open their minds and, and challenge some of the old academic dogmas. And, and it's about time. You know, it, it has to happen. What's interesting, and you're touching upon this, and to, to really hit this home for me, is if, and this is a big if, right? If man, uh, our current state of man that is supposed to, you know, only be 150,000 years old, and I accept that, <laughs> but, but let's, let's just say we base it there. Well, if, if we take that out of the play and we take uh, us, right, modern man, right. homo sapien sapien, 150,000-year-old man, and we make him 5 million years old and right. that the domestication of animals and wheat and everything else, that evolutionary process, took a million years, then I'm on board. I'm on board. It, it makes sense. But what didn't happen is is that one day we're hunter-gatherers and the next day we're <laughs> right. physicists. Right? right, exactly. It doesn't work that it way. It doesn't work that way, no. <laughs> no, it you doesn't. Know, give, me, and, give me millions of years of evolution. Look, Darwin obviously was wrong, right? It, 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 it didn't happen that way. There is no evolutionary thing anywhere going on anywhere. It, 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 it's not. It's just simply yeah, it's, not. We are here. The, the evolutionary paradigm doesn't explain, you know, how civilization got here very well. And, and this is the paradigm that, that's coming under such assault. And quite frankly, I think it ties directly into your theme of, of secret space programs because – I've, I've often thought that these post-war, you know, national security moguls, Alan Dulles and, and so on and so forth, right. had to have been aware at some point in their, in their confrontation with the UFO phenomenon that this isn't something new. And I strongly suspect, and in fact, I, I argued last year at the Secret Space Program conference down in Texas that... This would have impelled that group, I think, to go back at least to consider some of these ancient texts, some of these ancient stories from a very different point of view than simply a religious or mythological one, just, just by way of making sure that they were dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's in deciding how they're going to de deal with and, and, if necessary, confront the phenomenon. So I think this is a huge part of the story. Um, 
I think, so to speak, that if there is a breakaway civilization, and I'm really four square in agreement with Richard Dolan, you know, this is his observation that, that this is a possibility that we have to confront with the post-war national security state and the UFO problem. Uh, I, I really do think that if that civilization exists, and I think it does, that it's going to have a branch of historical studies, so to speak, to to go back and examine some of these ideas. With um, and and staying on the the Giza side of the secret space program, because you're absolutely right, everything is connected, and and we'll start to connect those dots in a second. The conversation that I was having today with my fellow researcher uh, mm -hmm. about Gobekli Tepe and and Giza. Mm -hmm. the the problem that academia has now that this is this is it's their choice they've painted this picture now they have to chew it and they have to <laughs> deal with it is is this it, the, the, what they wanted us to accept and i'm talking about the world every scholastic system period what they wanted us to accept that was everything happened at at 3000 bc and right. and before that there was nothing it didn't exist and then suddenly we have gobekli tepe yep gobekli tepe now and gobekli tepe is significant on about a thousand different fronts but the main one that they need to battle now is it's 7000 years older than giza oh yeah it's 7000 years older than mesopotamia it's 7000 yep. years older than iraq it's 7000 years older than anything that they wanted us to accept right now, now where did the knowledge of gobekli tepe come from you know you are taught this stuff there is another you know you, you don't nothing is original right nothing is everything is taught and then you you know you take that on in an evolutionary process cell phones uh, steve jobs didn't invent cell phones he didn't invent the iphone it was an evolutionary thing he was taught and that's the way life works and and that's it well, what explain Gobekli Tepe to me? Not you, academia. <laughs> explain right. that. Explain that one away, and they can't. And right. that is the problem that we have here. Well, they've been they've been covering all of this stuff for many many years. You know, there even in Herodotus, you get the the statement that at one time when the Great Pyramid itself was was covered with with its casing stones, that you could see a water line halfway up the structure. You know, and this is Herodotus, who admittedly, you know, isn't the most reliable source historically, but he's not alone in these types of comments. So in other words, it's been it's been a kind of a cherry picking of evidence that the academic world has done in order to, to drive a certain paradigm of, of history into our thinking. And this is all coming unraveled precisely because of things like Gobekli Tepe and, and so on and so forth. Or if you go to South America, Puma Punku and, and some of those monuments. That's right. This this is this is all coming unraveled, and I think I think we're we're driving to a certain extent a change. You know, the, the German physicist Max Planck once was asked, "What does it take for a new theory to gain credence?" And his remark, you know, was typically Prussian: uh, "It takes the old people dying off and the new people that are open to the new ideas to to, to gain the ascendancy." And I think that, to a certain extent, is also what we're seeing. We're seeing this being driven. Uh, not only by the discoveries, but we're we're seeing a new generation come into its own that's more open to challenge the basic paradigms. I was uh, listening to uh, a debunker the other night, a skeptic, listening to his presentation, and uh, this is <laughs> he was specifically talking about Puma Punku, and, <laughs> and, and, and this is this is this is how polluted I am. I swear to you. He's like, you're not giving ancient man enough credit. That's all they did was work with stone and they knew what they were doing. And, <laughs> and, and this is my answer to that. I could take, I don't care if it's red sandstone, you know, some soft rock, let alone some red granite, right? I could take a four foot by four foot block of granite, of stone, you pick it, limestone, whatever, drop it off at his house with all the modern right. technology today. <laughs> And in his lifetime, could not recreate one of the H blocks from Puma Punku. So don't right. tell me I'm not giving them enough credit 
because with all of the modern technology today, you are not going to level out, square out, carve round holes, slots, grooves, and recreate one of those H blocks in your garage. It ain't going to happen. You can have all the Dremel tools from Home Depot. <laughs> Right? <laughs> right. Well, it, it, not only that, but, you know, according to the standard academic theory, they're doing all of this with diorite, slurry, copper saws, you know, and some very primitive tools. And, and you know. And chicken my, bones. And chicken and, bones. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, my friend Igor Vitkovsky has kind of the same response to all of this that you do. Well, just chain him to one of these stones and give him the tools that they say that this was all produced with and let him produce it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's such egregious nonsense, Jimmy, that that it really frustrates me to see that academia would, would have gone along with this for so long. The only thing that I think rationalizes it to a certain extent is the fact that somebody somewhere knew that something much more significant was going on and they were attempting to cover it up. Uh, this this is the only way, ultimately, I think, that, that you can rationalize the behavior of what's gone on in the last hundred years. You know who I miss? And I want to ask you about this really quick. I miss Lloyd Pye. Yes. And and I, I miss him greatly. And, and I study and, and listen to everything that, that he did. And, and I miss him every single day. But there's one point that uh, that he mentions that I think you and I and other researchers, you know, and, and, and presenters and so forth in this, in this field, I think that we've kind of missed or kind of let go. And one of them is every single time something radical happened, you know, the end of the dinosaurs or other events that changed the, that we repopulated immediately. And it just seems that the only real answer, I mean, populated everything on right. the earth um the, the only thing that would really make sense is that quite it's it's very simple the only thing that fills all of those uh questions is we were seated yeah that's all you know yeah. and why is it so hard to accept that just maybe because if you joseph if you were on a starship going to another planet and you found an earth out there that was really cool what would you do you would seed it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You'd explore it. You'd colonize it. You'd seed it. You'd begin to develop it. Absolutely. That's absolutely. It. And, and so what is so wrong with that? It's the only thing that really makes sense here that, that answers all of those questions. Because 65 million years ago, uh, something really, really bad happened here. And it probably happened 100 million years before that. And 100 million years before that, there are these different events. And suddenly... We we had life, millions of forms of life that were all unique and organic and were suddenly growing. And there wasn't enough time for the evolutionary process that we're being force fed to have happened. Right. Right. Well, you know, the Dogon tribe in Africa has and the Zulus, for that matter, in Africa have have the uh, lore, the mythology that they actually came here from Mars and that other people uh, taught them the arts of civilization. The Zulu in particular is very interesting. Talk about leaving Mars because of a great planetary catastrophe in a, in a boat or a ship that they call a Merkaba, which I thought is really interesting because that's the Hebrew word for a boat. Right. You know, so there's all these little clues, just so many clues all over the world in, in ancient lore and ancient mythology that there's a very, very different thing that happened other than, you know, the Darwinist materialist evolutionary approach. And it's so radically different that it, it I think the text demand and, and now the archaeology demands that we start paying serious attention to it. And I think this is exactly really what this breakaway group started to do after the Second World War was over. Um, I think they, they, they started to look at these texts and myths in precisely that way. When there will be a point, and I know that you've referenced this in the past, so let's address this really quick before the break. Uh, there will be a point where that, uh, that Earth just gets a little too hot, right? Mm -hmm. the, the sun is just going to increase, and, and mm -hmm. uh, there, it, it, we won't be able to live here anymore. 
And mm-hmm. the only place, well, there would be plenty of them, but the, certainly the, the answer to everything is Mars, right? It's right there. So we can kick out a little bit more in the solar system. It's going to be a little, you know, we can do. And that's exactly what happened in the past. They went from Mars to here because something happened on Mars, mm-hmm. right? And right. That, that breakaway civilization is looking right now at the red planet. Oh, yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's so amazing. In the last five to 10 years, we've been hearing all of these stories, not only about asteroid mining, building moon bases, but they're coming so fast now. There's a story like this now almost every week in the news, if you're really looking for it. So this tells me that a quiet decision has been taken by the power elites to, to condition human opinion. You know that we've got to go to the stars. Uh, we've got to start. We've got to start becoming an interplanetary civilization with interplanetary commerce. And this is the key problem, because chemical rockets just ain't gonna do the job. And what all of this implies for me, then, is that they are quietly also getting ready for another huge paradigm shift, and that's in our, our energy technology, and that's going to imply, by, by the nature of the case, it's going to imply a very different system of finance than the one that we're under. And it's very interesting to me, you've seen uh, stories in the last couple of weeks, Saudi Arabia is planning a move away from oil. Uh, you've seen the Rockefeller Foundations divest themselves of all of their petroleum interests. And all of this tells me that they're getting ready for a big, huge, major shift. And it's probably going to be they're, – they're going to attempt to manage it. And I think this is part of, partly what we're facing with these stories is they're conditioning human opinion to get ready for it. Is it that uh, the, the money well, – you know, it's always about the money, but – that they have figured out a way to monetize this new energy? I think that's part of it. Um, I I also think that it's, I I used to say this, that the technology is so potentially destructive that they, they had to keep it in the bottle until they had a way to monitor it. And now they do with this global surveillance system that we're living under. Uh, they have a way to do this now that before they did not. And this is the other reason I think that some of this now is finally being allowed out into the open mainstream. And the other thing that has trickled in over the last six months into the media is NASA's new EM drive. That's right. Yes. That's right. And when they when they release in the press release Mars in 10 weeks with no fuel. Right. Yep. And that we're getting ready to go to white paper status. And this is something that is more simple than we could have ever imagined. And the right. technology is correct. We are ready to move forward with this Mars in 10 weeks. That's a paradigm shift. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's not forget NASA also with Dr. Sonny White has been exploring even the idea of warp drive and laying foundational proof of concept experiments and projects to bring this about. DARPA, and I I made this announcement at the Secret Space Program conference last year, DARPA has announced that it wants the United States to be warp capable in 100 years. That's in a century. Yeah, that's insane. It is. That's insane. Let's uh, let's jump into our first break here. Our guest tonight, Joseph P. Farrell. Night two of our Secret Space Program Breakaway Civilization Week. Nobody finer than Joseph P. Farrell, Ph.D. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Dr. Farrell when we come back. Stay right there. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Kakili and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. Hey folks, Life Change T here, reminding you that colds and flus suck. Feeling lousy sucks, and allergies really can be annoying. What if you could change that? What if you could drink something that changed the sick and tired scenario? Well, you can change how you feel with a little help from Life Change Tea. Life Change Tea is a drink you make, you control, and you drink. There are eight organic herbs that blend together and give you what you need to fight the flus and colds of this world. Less sickness is more relief. Life Change Tea can help with high blood pressure, constipation, high cholesterol, and much, much more just by drinking the tea. Read the numerous testimonies at GetTheTea.com. If you're tired of feeling lousy, order right now at GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or you can call us at 928 308 that's 928-308-0408. If you've heard this commercial more than once and someone's trying to tell you something, it's time to get well. Get the tea.com. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. Talk Stream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Back to Fade to Black. Day two of our Breakaway Civilization Secret Space Program week. It's better than Shark Week on History Channel. Or Discovery, whatever that's on. His books include The Giza Death Star, The Giza Death Star Deployed, Reich of the Black Sun, The Giza Death Star Destroyed, The SS Brotherhood of the Bell, The Cosmic War, Secrets of the Unified Field and the Philosopher's Stone, Joseph P. Farrell. Joseph, the definition of a breakaway civilization, I think that uh, I, I have about two or three uh, definitions, all of them dark. What's yours? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of four square with Richard Dolan's idea that the breakaway civilization forms itself in the national security structure, which by persisting over time and with a large, not only black budget, but I think in, in addition to that, and a totally hidden system of finance, uh, this is a lot of money, which 
if this is persisting over time, will allow that group of technocrats and scientists basically to pull so far ahead of the rest of humanity in their technological capabilities and the cultural outlook that's formed by possession of something like that that they become, in effect, a breakaway civilization. In other words, a totally different uh, extraterritorial, underground, hidden system of a very few people in possession of some extraordinary technologies and sophistication. And that, of course, obviously has its its dark implications. Did Were we close to uh, disclosure with that in, back in 2001 with Rumsfeld? I, it, if he, I mean, <laughs> obviously if 9-11 hadn't had happened, uh, there would have been discussion that was going to start to occur on September 11th on this subject. And, right. and somebody, the answers would have had to have been given uh, right. to this missing two and a half, three trillion dollars, which back in 2001 money was bigger than our budget at that time. Today, Absolutely. yeah, today our budget is three, three, you know, two and a half, three trillion dollars today. I, I went through that yesterday on the show. Uh, it's an extraordinary amount of money. But in 2001, he was talking about two and a half to three trillion dollars of missing money. money right well i think yeah this is a huge part of the story if you if you look at all the missing money that has appeared and in, in been brought about or brought into the public's mind you know people like Catherine fitz and so on you're talking over several decades of of several trillions of dollars and that's just this country you know you turn to russia and you look at all the missing money there after the collapse of the soviet union and you're dealing here with potentially a a global network so to speak that has so much money and has had it for decades and has been able to funnel this money into black research projects, I think it becomes very possible that this this idea of a breakaway civilization not only exists, but it's slowly, I think, as we discussed before the break, it's slowly beginning to reveal itself. This is the other part of the equation. But yeah, I think it's definitely there. It's definitely there. You know, in my research, Jimmy, I've I've been suggesting for quite a while now that one of the things that the national security establishment would have done in connection with the UFO problem after World War II is realize, first of all, that if we are going to achieve some sort of technological parity or performance parity with the phenomenon that we're observing, this is going to require an enormous Manhattan-sized project on steroid. And that in its turn is going to require an enormous amount of finance that by the nature of the case is going to have to be completely hidden and off the books. We're not even talking black budget here. It's, it's got to be enormous over several decades. And this is precisely what we see has happened. And I think Rumsfeld, in a certain sense, in, in that um, amazing remark that he made before 9-11, I think Rumsfeld was kind of inadvertently letting the cat out of the bag, and that should tell us something, because that means that even at the level of, of the federal cabinet, these people are really not in the know. So that's a testimony to, to the existence of this breakaway civilization idea right there. I can only imagine what was going through Washington <laughs> right. If you think of what, what did he, did, did he say three trillion? <laughs> Be, because their job is to collect money and spend it. Right. That's it. That's that's your job and make a few laws and, and you know, and oppress us. You know, there's that part of it. too. But, <laughs> there's that part. Of it. <laughs> yeah, there's that part. But it's their job to to collect money and to spend it and appropriate it. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's and then to and they fight over. This money, they fight over it, and the pie is only so big, as they are told. And so to to pay Peter, you're going to borrow from Paul. And if you're going to put some money into this budget, into this project, into that agency, you've got to give up something else over here. There is no more money, right? That's what they're told. There is no more, man. There's no more. And then suddenly he drops that bomb. Right. I, I can only imagine what was being discussed there. What do you mean there's more money? What do you mean there's three trillion 
more Mi- missing <laughs> missing money <laughs> i have been fighting for a new streets in kansas city right i've been looking for federal funding for a couple of new elementary schools right and now you're telling me that we're missing three trillion dollars can you imagine what was actually discussed and then boom 9-11. 9-11. Right. Exactly. Well, I, I think the missing money story itself is really, as I indicated, it's really kind of the tip of the iceberg to, to what we've really seen happen. If you total up all these announcements of missing money here, missing money there, what you're dealing with, Jimmy, is a figure, as, as far as my best estimates go, in the tens, if not hundreds of trillions of dollars. Right. Now my problem with this and my problem with with typical ordinary run of the mill financial analysts and and I'm four square in agreement with with Catherine Austin Fitz here is if you do not factor in this breakaway civilization, if you do not factor in the idea that there is a hidden system of finance that was put into place by President Truman after World War II utilizing Axis loot, incidentally, that they're keeping all off the books. If you don't factor this into your financial analysis, you're going to have only 50% of the picture, if even that. Right. So we're dealing with hundreds of trillions of dollars. And here's the other problem. I, I view money like I, I view electricity. You put power in at one end of the circuit, and it's, and it's going to come out, has to come out at the load end. Well, if you've got that much financial juice, so to speak, in your circuit, it should be manifesting itself as hyperinflation by now. But it's not. So that raises the question of, well, then where is it going and what is it doing? And once we once we look at it that way, the only conclusion is it's got to be going into something completely hidden, into some rather sophisticated technologies. And a part of it, and here comes the whopper, a part of this money simply seems to be disappearing. And the only place it could be disappearing, quite frankly, is off the planet. So in other words, we're dealing with such astronomical sums of money by now over the last few decades that the possibility arises that it's a component of some sort of secret international or, pardon me, interplanetary commerce. And, you know, that raises the stakes considerably because why now and in conjunction do we see all of this sudden scramble for asteroid defense systems? Well, you know, if you're if you're conducting commerce off planet, then you've got to be able to protect that commerce from, you know, any potential threat. So a lot of this, I think, if you look at it a certain way, is is signaling to me that we're we are dealing in in reality, not just in fiction, not just as a hypothesis, but we are dealing in reality with some group on this planet that has extraordinary technology, that has incredibly deep, rich pockets, because this is the only way to rationalize otherwise irrational financial behavior. The system does not make sense on any closed, merely terrestrially based financial system. It simply doesn't. And then we have the other thing, because you touch upon it. We we can't see what is going on off planet, right? right? We can't see it. And then, but what about what we can't see here? In other words, underground installations. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at at what is going on, and this is the other part of the story I'm so glad that you brought up. This amount of money will buy you underground installations. It'll buy you underground cities. It'll buy you intercontinental underground transportation networks. It'll buy you a lot of plasma, you know, nuclear plasma boring machines to build all of this stuff. Uh, so, yeah, you've, you've got also, I think, uh, Jimmy, the absolute possibility of a vast infrastructure that we know nothing about. Absolutely nothing. Three trillion dollars. That's only one year, by the way. We that's only one year. That's yeah. only one year. So three trillion dollars. Uh, and I threw this out at you earlier today. But if you think about it, three trillion dollars probably could rebuild a brand new United States Yes. Top to bottom, every building, every structure, every street, everything, everything that we know, brand new, bum, right. done. Right. Probably twice as big. 
<laughs> well, and, and this raises another problem, Jimmy, because th the fact that it could build all of this infrastructure, public infrastructure, and that it is not doing so suggests to me that we might be looking at a, a war-based economy. In other words, that this is disappearing into something that might be the financial mechanism to support some sort of conflict. And I raise that because if you go back to um, when Lieutenant Colonel Corso's day after Roswell came out, many people in the ufology com community now dismiss that book. I don't. Uh, I'm not so quick to dismiss it because one of the things that he said in that book was that we had been in some sort of quiet conflict or war with the ETs or whatever you wish to call them. And that by the end of the Reagan era and the early um, Bush one administration era, we had managed to stalemate the situation. So in other words, that whole post-war development, those, those three to four decades of, of hidden finance in the trillions of dollars paid off, but it paid off in such a way that it went to something like weaponry, which will not show up in, as an immediate inflationary bubble in the public economy. So there's all sorts of possibilities here. It's the financial angle of all of this to me that signals that something huge has been going on and it's probably connected with this breakaway civilization because look at it another way. Many people in, in the alternative research community have been looking at this hidden system of finance, but what they have concluded, I think erroneously, is that this vast sum of money was simply a political slush fund that was used to fight communism. Well, for crying out loud, you don't need trillions of dollars to conduct false flag operations in Paris or Brussels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you would need trillions of dollars if you are a attempting to develop exotic propulsion technologies, exotic energy technologies, exotic weaponry technologies, and so on. I'm looking right now at a document in front of me of a U.S. patent that was taken out in January 25, 1994. This is patent number 5,280,864. It's by James F. Woodward, and listen to what the patent is for. Quote, method for transiently altering the mass of objects to facilitate their transport or change their stationary apparent weights. In other words, anti-gravity. Yeah, right, <laughs> what, right, 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 right. Now, this is 1994. <laughs> You know, and uh, granted, a, a grant of a patent is not a certification that the thing actually works. But I'm looking at a whole list of these things that are right there in, in the public eye. So imagine you've got Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or, or Boeing or some company like this that not only feeds at the trough of the black budget, but that has been able to tap into this this hidden system of finance that is totally out of the control of even the black budget items of, of the congressional budget. Once you factor in that kind of thinking, then you're looking at the very real possibility in my mind that they have some extraordinary technologies and that what all of this public display that we have seen of talk about asteroid mining and moon bases and going to Mars and so on and so forth. When we get right down to it, Jimmy, and admit the facts, chemical rockets aren't going to do the job anywhere close to adequately or anywhere close to cost effectiveness. You've got to have a different technology to do it. And I think this is what they're doing. They're slowly driving this into the public conscience. You bring up such a great point about the day after Roswell, um, which I bought the day it was released, by the way. Yeah, that, me too. <laughs> that book, I got it in hardcover. That, and I loaned it to my dentist and never got it back. But that <laughs> book, uh, yeah, factually, if you, it, that's, that's not what, it, it's the idea of the book. Yes. The, the, the germ that yes. is, is the book that is alarming. And I'll, yeah. and I'll bring up another point, just like we were talking about ancient Sumer, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the idea that everything just sprouted at 3500 BC, and 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 that's that's the facts, ma'am. Right? Just as we are talking about that, if I read in 
in a, a textbook, if I read one more time, if I see the year 1947 pop up one more time, not in you, <laughs> not in UFO circles, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm just referring to in historical, right? Just 1947. Right. Well, yeah, well, actually that happened in 1947. Well, you know, that, and I'm reading 1947, 19, in, in technology, in, in, in the historical records of uh, uh, across the board, not only in a commercial sense, in a military sense, and 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 so forth. 1947 is a year that, just like 3500 BC, supposedly everything happened. And they're not connected to each other. No, and they're not connected. <laughs> it's really start, and it's not Corso's fault. You know, it, no. <laughs> it's really bizarre to me that I think that. A uh, hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, our generations are going to go back and go. Really, nineteen forty-seven again? Just like we do with thirty-five hundred BC. And I'm not right. kidding about that. It's it's in the it's in nineteen forty-seven is a crazy number. And then just throw Roswell into it. That happened to happen <laughs> that same year. In, in the same year. Well, that, I was just going to say, if you look at the year nineteen forty-seven, there's there are amazing things happening. This is the this is the year that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. That's right. It's the year that that Admiral Byrd made his little expedition down to Antarctica and then left after only a few weeks when the expedition is outfitted for months. Ding, ding. He gives that strange little interview for El Mercurio in, in Santiago, Chile. And then you've got Kenneth Arnold's uh, UFO sightings in, in Washington State. Then you have the Roswell incident. Then you have, within a couple of months, suspiciously enough, non-coincidentally enough, you have President Truman signing the National Security Act into law that creates the CIA and the NSA. And on top of all of that, that is the same year that he also, according to, to the researchers of this hidden financial system, that that's the year that he decides to go ahead with the recovery of all of this Axis loot and to keep it a state secret. And I'll, I'll throw one more, the icing on the cake. It was the year that we invented the transistor. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Throw that one in. Throw that one into the mix. And there's much more. But right. it, it's it's nuts how 1947 is just supposed to be the, the year that all of these miracles happened. Right, right. I, I don't view any of this as coincidental. I, I think there's a deep relationship, a deep pattern that is connecting, you know, Roswell, Kenneth Arnold, Admiral Byrd, and then the creation of the intelligence agencies. And in the same month, if not within a month, the creation of this hidden system of finance, utilizing all that Axis loot. I think all of this is definitely part of a pattern. I think it, it affects this breakaway civilization group. Uh, you know my take on it, that I, th I think that they made the bargain, the dirty deal with the devil, with the Nazi devil, mm -hmm. when they created this, this breakaway civilization. And that's why it looks so fascist in some respects. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a non-coincidental year. These things are all deeply connected, absolutely. And I'll, uh, I'll, I want your opinion on your take on the X-37B, right, the secret space plane, because right. when we're talking about a secret space program and, and somebody wants to go and dismiss it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll point out right now, X-37B, there's your top secret space program that we know of. That we know of. That right. we know of that's, that's going up there for a year or two at a time. We know nothing about its mission, what it's doing up there for two friggin' years, number one. Number two, the staff that is behind it, what is inside of it, what are they doing, what are they connecting with, what is the mission, who are the people behind it. And if you want to know something secret, there it is right there because you don't know nothing about the X-37. Not you, Joseph, the, the public. Right. You don't know anything about the X-37B, and you're not going to find out. If you want to know about a secret being kept, there's an example of a secret space program running in parallel in an alternate universe of our own right now. Well, I'll go you one better. Let's look. Let's look at Gary McKinnon. You know, the the British guy that supposedly hacked into the Department of Defense and discovered, according to his own story, discovered there that the United States had thirty five 
ships listed, spaceships listed with the captains and the crews. And of course, you know the story that, you know, NASA and, and the Department of Defense tried to extradite him unsuccessfully from Great Britain as as a punishment for the crime. And they went nearly apoplectic over this guy. And everybody kind of dismissed that story, but let's look back at President Reagan's memoirs. When Reagan published his memoirs, I, th I think that it was shortly after he left office, he revealed in the memoir something that just to this day floors me how he managed to get it past the censors. And that was that when he was taking office, he was briefed that the United States had a lifting capacity, a personnel lifting capacity for space of about 300 people. Now, if you look at the existing space shuttles at that time, we had a, what, five or six with, that could lift a, a crew of seven people. So, you know, that's what, 35 people. So you're talking an order of magnitude of an actual lifting capacity way beyond what was in the public record at that time. And this is what President Reagan puts in his memoirs. Oh, I was relieved to find out that we had the ability to transport about 300 people using our, our current space assets. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? And so along comes Gary McKinnon, and he says pretty much the same thing a, a few decades later. By, and what was interesting about McKinnon is he, he named names. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and rank, too. And rank, yes, exactly. And now um, and there, there's another little twist to this. we got two minutes. We're going to hit a break. But we can't ignore what Ben Rich said, which oh, yeah. was we have the technology to take E.T. home, right? Right. Now, if we take that and then double back into – uh, not only the EM drive and the warp drive that 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 part of it is what they're disclosing to us. We both know that that technology is already there and solid. They just happen to be telling us about it now. But is uh, DARPA working on downloadable conscious, right? And right. that is their goal. That uh, that is all. DARPA's budgets right now are all focused on computers and interfacing with the brain and downloading conscious. Why would they want to do that? Because you, Joseph Farrell, would be on a thumb drive. You plug into your Starship cruiser and you, and you head out to the stars. And that is a secret space program right there, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Rich said something else that's very significant. He said that we found an error in the equations, and now we can take E.T. home. And the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, okay, whose equations? What equations are we talking about here? That's right. But the more significant thing about that remark is what he's really disclosing is that there's a public consumption physics and then there is a secret physics that is different from what we are told and taught. And this is a huge, to me, uh, Jimmy, this is the other huge part of the story. You look at certain researchers, uh, Tom Beard and Paula Violette and people like this, and they're saying essentially the same thing, that there's something wrong with the paradigm of physics that is being taught publicly, because that paradigm, in effect, dead ends. You know, you've got uh, string theory, which is a non-testable theory. It's a mathematical formalism, and therefore a certain kind of a dogma, rather than a scientific theory. It's not testable. So if public consumption physics looks to me like it's deliberately designed as a dead end, but then you have all of these people doing things that are challenging the paradigm, you know, going all the way back to Pons and Fleischmann and cold fusion. Right. So, yeah, there, there's a secret physics. Let's uh, let's jump into a break. And when we come back, let's let's go into that. And also, I want to talk about some of the things that Corey Good uh, uh, was talking about last night, too, as well federations, alliances, and agreements with E.T. Our guest tonight, Dr. Joseph Farrell. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. 
always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Not being able to fall asleep is so frustrating. The tossing, the turning, the adjustment of pillows and blankets. Ugh! Eventually, you just decide to get up and start your day really early. It doesn't have to be this way, though. Power Sleep is an all-natural, non-prescription formula that will help you sleep like a baby. It contains neurotransmitter nutrients that promote the production of serotonin, which is responsible for feelings of well-being. Power Sleep is easy to digest and absorb and is made in a base of active probiotics. Don't miss another night of sleep. Order your Power Sleep at energywave.com or call 800-TURTLE-5. Add Power Vites to your cart while you're browsing. Perfect for Monday mornings. They're a complete multivitamin and mineral formula that will give you the energy you need to get through your day. Nourish your immune system and feel great. Get all the info and place your order at energywave.com. Enter code word SLEEP to get free shipping. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, the deep right center. Back goes Lewis to the wall, and it's all here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With a mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. To Fade to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Our guest tonight, Dr. Joseph P. Farrell. Day two of our Breakaway Civilization Secret Space Program Week. It is better than Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. I'll, I'll toot my own horn. Um, Joseph, the uh, last night we had on Corey Good, and, and I think he's mm-hmm. great and uh, dynamic and comprehensive and 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 he has chosen to come forward but there's there's another interesting twist to him coming forward and that is hillary podesta uh, obama mm-hmm. uh, clinton and the other drip 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 that we're getting right now out of dc is is there an interaction that is going on that this kind of idea is now being fed to us as as a planet well i i honestly don't know but i do think that there is something going on and let me explain why um at the last secret space program conference down in in bay strip texas i gave a couple of talks on what i call the versailles template of so to speak interstellar relations And this is based on the idea that if you go back and examine and look at certain ancient texts, it almost appears that what you're looking at is a kind of cosmic Versailles. 
in that you have within ancient lore, you have within certain occult traditions, the idea that the earth has been surrounded, so to speak, by a demilitarized zone, by a quarantine zone. And depending on the source that you look at, this is either the orbit of the moon or it's the or orbit of the outermost planet of the solar system and so on and so forth. Now, this is very similar to what the Allies did at, to Germany after World War I, after a huge conflict, in other words. And if you look even further at World War I, well, what was it? Kaiser Wilhelm was the grandson of Queen Victoria, the cousin of Tsar Nicholas, related to the Habsburgs and the Savoys, and so on and so forth. So you had a big family fight. And this is exactly what you see in the ancient texts. You see a cosmic war that's a big family fight. At the end of World War I, the Allies impose a demilitarized zone on Germany, demilitarize the Rhineland, and then a bridgehead 30 kilometers to the east on the east bank of the Rhine. In other words, push the, the jumping off point for any potential German militarization back behind the Rhine River. And I think if, if you're this national security establishment, you've got to be concerned as you're going into outer space that if you're looking at these types of texts, that they might indicate that a similar agreement is in place and has been in place since very, very high antiquity. Now, that's interesting because what do we do with our space probes? You know, this idea that we're in contact with some sort of beings or extraterrestrials or what have you, that there's there's an interplanetary thing out there that, that we're talking with. Well, what do you do if you suspect that there might have been such a treaty system in place? Well, the first thing you do is you make awful darn sure that your space programs are carrying little plaques saying that we're coming in peace for all mankind. Right. You know, this is not a military incursion, all right? And that is an interesting way of looking at it because by the same token, it also means that inevitably you're thinking of remilitarizing the Rhineland like you know who did. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so, you know, I think all of this is, is plausible if you, if you accept the idea, first of all, that there is a breakaway civilization with exotic technology Technologies with an off-the-books science that you know that in itself implies a breakaway civilization right there when Ben Rich made those remarks that's what he's really telling you there's a breakaway civilization it has its own science that you out there in the public know nothing about well for the unindoctrinated uh, for what you and I are discussing here to best explain this idea back at them it's it's very simple what is it that we have been doing since the dawn of time? We have looked to the stars and wondered if we are alone. Right. That, that's it. And all we do is want to explore. We have Hubble and, and, and different uh, and Kepler, and we are trying to find those exoplanets, and we're yes. searching for life. Well, E.T. has been doing the same thing for right. millions of years. Right. And that's it. You have to base everything on what would we do, right? And and well, E.T. is doing the exact same thing. Well, let me touch upon this because you, you bring up a good point. Our probes, right, they're unarmed, well, allegedly. And, and, and our probes are unarmed, and we're out there searching. Not only our moon and Mars, but we're, you know, we've now shot past our own solar system. And that's what we are doing. Well, E.T., you don't necessarily have to have life on, on a probe coming back and searching, you know, and exploring Earth or other, you know, other, other planets. And our planet glows in the dark. It's covered in water. It's beautiful. Right. It, it, it's lit up. <laughs> Excuse me. E.T. has known we are here for millions of years. They've known about this planet, and they've been coming at us for a very, very, very long time. And that's the best way that I can explain it to somebody that doesn't quite get what you and I are talking about. E.T. has known about us forever. Our planet is four and a half billion years old. We've been visited for a very long time. Well, let's let's shift let's shift the paradigm of of looking at that to a slightly different model. If indeed those ancient texts indicate that there was some sort of, of cosmic war fought in this planetary system, in our solar system, as I think they clearly indicate, 
And if that war ended, it was, you know, was the cosmic equivalent of World War One. you know, a big, huge stalemate that everybody just gets tired of fighting and goes home. Right. If that's the case, you're going to do two things. Look at what the Allies did to Germany after World War One. They insisted that the Germans, you know, build no more artillery beyond a certain caliber. You know, the French had had enough of that big German stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, no airplanes, no tanks, tiny army, demilitarized zone. So if you're the French, are you going to sit back and simply let the Germans assure you that, no, we're not building any of that stuff anymore? Well, of course not. You're going to send in spies. You're going to insist in your treaty uh, agreement that you have the right to go in unannounced into any German industrial plant and inspect it to make awful darn sure that this stuff isn't being built again. And you're going to have a system of spies to back it up. In other words, you're going to be monitoring compliance with the treaty. And if this war was indeed fought, then whoever is out there that was a part of, of the combatants of that war, they're going to be monitoring the monkeys on this planet to make awful darn sure that they don't build anything dangerous or threatening. Exactly. And isn't it interesting that you see this spike? of UFO activity beginning in World War II, concentrated around um, Nazi and, and allied atomic uh, research plants and facilities, and this continues in, an, in a clear and palpable pattern all the way on up into the Cold War, you know, UFOs over Russian ICBM sites, American ICBM sites, British nuclear facilities, French nuclear facilities, and so on and so forth. Well, to me, this indicates monitoring. It indicates reconnaissance. It indicates somebody is awful darn concerned about what we might be doing and eventually planning. And there is the awful coincidence that after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's been no other offensive use of nuclear weapons. Right. I, right. Yeah, that is not a coincidence. No, I don't think so. Um, uh, you know, the the interesting thing, there's a researcher out there by the name of Robert Hastings that wrote a wonderful book called UFOs and Nukes. It's about a 500-page book. And he talks about an incident in 1982 in, in Bielokorovica in the Ukraine where a UFO appeared over a flight of, of Soviet ICBMs and initiated the launch sequence. And, of course, you had the Russian crews frantically trying you know, to shut this thing down. And they couldn't until at the very, very last minute, you know, the, the UFO flew away and, and the launch sequence stopped. And you had similar incidents in, in this country. So on that score alone, Jimmy, on, on, on the fact that you have this type of interest being exhibited by whomever in these tremendous weapons of mass destruction, do you think for a minute that the national security establishment of any of the nuclear powers that had gone through this is not going to consider the question carefully and classify it at the deepest level and attempt to not only to study the phenomenon, but perhaps even to emulate it? Of course they will. And, I mean, this is very clear. And not only that, and that is that, that may be the most extreme point that we need to emphasize here, but the other part of it is clearly we are not in control <laughs> of our most sophisticated technology. Yeah, this is the other thing. If you if you have spent all of this money and it can be turned off with the push of, of an electromagnetic pulse of some sort, or even for that matter, as, as Hastings uh, documented in some of uh, the American cases, <coughs> pardon me, where the targeting information in the ICBMs was altered. If you're confronted with something like that, then yeah, you are going to you are going to make it a national security matter at the highest level. Now, interestingly enough, one of the things that Hastings reports in this book, and and I highly recommend it to your audience. It's a, it's a very good book. Uh, one of the things that he reports is that after a, an incident like this at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. The United States Air Force, this was in the early 60s, they called in the Boeing company to study it. <laughs> and Boeing was able to reproduce the effect. How did they do it? Exactly. 
So this indicates, you know, that we may not be looking necessarily at something extraterrestrial in its technological nature. We might be looking <laughs> at a hidden human system that was on display to the public powers that be. Who knows? You know, it could go either way. <laughs> but that, again, I think is yet another one of those um, subtle indicators that you are dealing quite possibly with the very real possibility of a breakaway civilization a la richard dolan's idea what do you think the uh, you know the big question obviously is what is the end game is the end game uh, i'll throw a couple of ideas out there is the end game to make sure that we grow up and and mature and learn how to love each other that that's as crazy as that sounds that's a possibility is the end game to wipe out humans here on earth because they want to take over the planet and use it as their own not a far-fetched idea because when you know we take over a, an island somewhere and you want to build a house there you go and clear out the poisonous snakes right <laughs> we don't <laughs> you know whatever right we don't have a problem with exterminating mice in our homes or roaches or or things and bug right. spray. We don't have an issue with with doing that. Before you have guests come over to the house at a barbecue, you go and 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 light the bug zappers in the backyard. And and, and I know that that sounds inhumane, but is that another play? What is the end game for uh, an interplanetary species that is looking at Earth? What is the end game? Well, that I don't know, but I'm. I'm with you in that I do not and never have subscribed to the idea that if there are extraterrestrials, they're all our space brothers. Right. Um, because, quite frankly, if you look at the ancient records and indicators of the possibility of this cosmic war, this was not a nice group of people. Uh, they did not have humanity's best interests at heart, and nor did we theirs, to be quite frank. Um, so I suspect that if there's an end game here, it's along the lines of, of what Dr. Carol Rosen has so insisted upon over the years. You know, she's got her affidavit of what she says Werner von Braun told her. Right. And this is proven to be an astonishingly accurate template. When she first came out with this back in the late 1990s, you know, people kind of scoffed and laughed at her because, according to her, von Braun said, well, you know, we've got a militarized space. And the, the first reason that's going to be offered for it is the communists. Then you're going to have terrorists. Then you're going to have nations of concern. Then you're going to have asteroids. And what stage are we in now? Right. Well, every, everybody wants to build these asteroid zappers, you know, uh, blow them up with big, huge hydrogen bombs or zap them into vapor with, with gigantic lasers and so on and so forth. We're in the asteroid stage. And the final thing that Von Braun told her was, well, extraterrestrials is going to be the last thing that, that they're going to pop as, a, as a, a cover story for the need or necessity to militarize and weaponize space. So we're in the penultimate stage here. And this, again, if, if we take it seriously, this suggests that, that this breakaway group came to the conclusion, number one, that they're dealing with hostiles. And number two, that we have to make humanity, give humanity a demonstrable technology that we have achieved either parity or near parity with them in terms of our ability to defend ourselves. So, yeah, I think I think it could be a, a not too pleasant picture that we might be looking at. When, you know, Reagan made his famous speech, you know, I use, right. I use a part of it for the intro of uh, Fade to Black because I think it's extraordinary. Yeah, all of that is done with. Uh, now I know that he intentionally rewrote that speech, but yeah, uh, and and kept adding in those lines. Uh, his speechwriter said no, and he said yes, and 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 he ended up doing it anyway. He didn't just do it once at the United Nations. He made these right. comments a few times, and all of that is premeditated. That is done with intent. He didn't have a slip of the tongue. No, mm -hmm. And so with that, do you think that he knew about E.T. or that he was just paranoid? 
No, I don't think he was paranoid at all. Because again, remember what I mentioned earlier that when he, in his memoirs, wrote about being briefed. Right. When he took office about American space capabilities, he was told that we had the ability to to transport 300 personnel, which was far beyond the publicly acknowledged space pro, uh, space shuttle program at that time. Uh, you know, by an order of magnitude. So I don't think this was paranoia. I think really what this was was an attempt on his part to break through, first of all, in, in American-Soviet relations. And it's very interesting that he mentioned this apparently at the uh, Reykjavik summit, if I remember correctly, with um, Premier Gorbachev. And Gorbachev's response is very interesting. Most people f focus on Reagan, but few people remember what Gorbachev responded to all of this, you know, we'll join together if, if we're facing a threat from E.T., Gorbachev's response wasn't to reject the idea totally. His response was, it isn't time yet. Interesting. Bas yeah, right. basically, right. It's, it's, it's basically um, something to do with the timing of this. And I thought that was incredibly intriguing that, you know, the premier of the then Soviet Union is, is couching things in these terms because... What it brought to my mind, Jimmy, was you go all the way back to President Kennedy and his attempts to create a joint international moon program right. with the Soviets. Right. And you recall that, that Khrushchev finally, if, if you're following the research of Richard Hoagland, Khrushchev apparently finally decided that he was going to take Kennedy up on it. And this was mere days before Kennedy's assassination. That's right. And I find this uniquely interesting because Kennedy, because of this, this program that he wanted to do with the Soviets, had ordered the CIA to release and declassify anything that did not have a national security implication for UFOs so that he could share them with the Soviets. And that, to me, is so reminiscent. Khrushchev's response, Kennedy's statements, is so reminiscent of Reagan and Gorbachev that what it indicates to me is that there's a pattern of decision making and policy making that exists behind the scenes that is relatively consistent over a long period of time from the Kennedy to the Reagan administrations. And a similar policy, for that matter, inside the Soviet Union. And that indicates, in its turn then, a network of global extent that is looking at this problem and basically coming up with the same sort of answers. The only thing wrong here, as Gorbachev said, was the timing of it. There's something else uh, that I want to hit uh, 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 before the break, which is you remember when the space shuttle first was uh, presented on television floating on the back of uh, the 747. Yes, what year was that? I think that was in the late 70s, if I'm not mistaken. It was sometime in the 70s because Werner von Braun had actually seen the plans for the shuttle. So he was still alive at the time. Right. 1975. Right. right yeah. 1976. Somewhere in there. Now, yeah. Well, it was because I left the country in 77 and I saw it on television before I left. Now. So uh, 1975, 1976. And our space program, I don't care what anybody wants to say at JPL or, or NASA, the public version of our space program has not progressed at all since then. Right. In, in fact, we don't even have the space shuttle program anymore. That's already right. gone. Right. And, and we're still dropping uh, stuff into the ocean. Right. That's, right. That, that's our technology. The same technology we had in 1960. The right. same principles, everything is still in play, apparently. And we all know that that is a bunch of BS. The mm -hmm. program has completely progressed. And that's the evidence when, when we talk about a secret space program. If you want to tell me that we haven't done anything since 1975. No. Right. That's 40 years. 40 years 
of of this massive tech technology uh, explosion that we've had around the world on all fronts, and that our space program has not moved one inch forward. In fact, without the space shuttle, apparently it's gone backwards. Right. Right. No, I, I don't buy that either. And for the same reasons that you don't. Uh, the very simple the very simple consideration here is number one there's too much money in this hidden system of finance I, I mean the sums of money are just simply astronomical number two they have been consistently astronomical since the end of world war ii so if you're putting into place a a manhattan sized project on steroids that is designed to research the technologies to emulate UFO performance characteristics. That's where this money has gone. And you can't tell me, let, let, let's, let's, let's just look at the fact of, of Thomas Townsend Brown, you know, experimenting with his charged discs yes. in, in vacuum in the 19... 30s and 40s and 50s and then proposing this project to the united states they reject it so the french government picks it up and he goes over to france and performs the experiments and they say thank you very much you can go home now you can't tell me that since the 1950s with that vast amount of money with people like ben rich saying the things that they're saying with president reagan saying the things that he's saying you can't tell me that these are not prima facie indicators that there is a civilization on this planet with access to some very sophisticated technology that they've been doing this on their own. After all, if they're a breakaway civilization, they don't need us and our chemical rockets to go out and explore the solar system and make contact with whoever. No, <laughs> they're simply not going to do it. No, they don't. And who was Von Braun's, I know that you've uh, written about this, Von Braun's number two, his famous quote, you know, when when he was asked, how did you guys get this done? We had help. That was we Herman Oberert. Right. Yeah, Herman Oberert. Yeah, th there's, a, there's another, you know, there's another whole can of worms right there with all these Nazis. And, you know, what, what were they really up to? But uh, you've, you, you've got all of these people working in, and thinking on all these things. And, and again, it's the time factor plus money equals what? Well, it equals what Ben Rich is saying. We found an error in the equations. Now we can take E.T. home uh, and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, he's not the only one. There have been other people that have come out and, and told their stories and basically confirmed these things. Now, I'm not, I'm not a, as you know, I'm not a storyteller and I'm not um, a whistleblower. I don't rely on any of that in my research. I'm a nuts and bolts documents kind of guy. And everything that I have seen, Jimmy, both in terms of, of the technology, even the stuff that's in the public record, for crying out loud, plus the money, plus the indicators that scientists are finding very strange effects that they've been playing with and, and so on and so forth. All the stuff in the public record convinces me that we are, in fact, dealing with some group here on this planet that has access to these technologies that far exceed anything that is in the public eye. What would anything surprise you today? And, uh, and what I mean is this. If you were driving down some desert highway, right, and you're just you're going across the country and you mm -hmm. see a disc whiz by and it says USAF right on the side, <laughs> would that surprise you? Yes, it would. And you know why? Because if you look at the um, if you look at the record, Everything in the record suggests to me that this is a not a national group. It's an international corporate group uh, with deep ties to some very, very uh, shady people. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so that what I think has happened, and I, I think what Richard Dolan was getting at when he first made those remarks in, in his UFO and National Security State books about about breakaway civilization. I think what has happened is that these corporations have pulled away from their national governments.
So you're what you're saying, we're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, we're going to take some phone calls. So everybody get ready. 323-825-5045. So what you're saying is if it flew by and it said Pan Am, you'd be cool with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would expect that. Exactly. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Joseph P. Farrell. Your call's next. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. If your home has hard water and it's leaving white spots, then it's likely that Limescale is clogging your pipes. Limescale can cost hundreds of dollars a year in wasted energy and early appliance breakdown. HydroCare systems available at Wave Home Solutions prevent and remove Limescale with just a simple filter change every three years. There are no salts, chemicals, or magnetic coils. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, just go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. If you're a talk radio fan, accessradio.net lets you listen to the best talk shows anytime and from anywhere. Works on your mobile or landline phone, and there's no cost if you have unlimited minutes. No need to use your data. Find your favorite talk show listen lines and discover new ones. Now you can listen on your schedule. Go to accessradio.net. That's accessradio.net. Save your favorite listen lines today. Hi, I'm Richard Dolan. When I'm not hosting my radio program, The Richard Dolan Show on KGRA, or writing new books on UFOs, I run a publishing company. I'm proud to say that Richard Dolan Press has published some of the most fascinating books available on UFOs and related subjects. They include Dr. Bruce Maccabee's classic analysis of the UFO cover-up, David Marler's breakthrough book on triangular UFOs, Dr. Richard Souter's unique work on underground bases, and other classics by Grant Cameron, Chase Kletsky, and Dr. Bob Wood. Not to mention intriguing works by Eve Lorgan and Laurie McDonald that deal with truly bizarre phenomena. I'm proud to publish such high quality and original works, and there are several amazing books about to be released over the next few months. Go to richarddolanpress.com to learn more. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Day two. Breakaway Civilizations and the Secret Space Program Week here on Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Joseph P. Farrell. Last night, Corey Good. Tomorrow night, Richard Dolan. You guys, this audience is spoiled rotten. And I just went on record right now. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hey, Jimmy. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. Who's calling? Okay, this is Captain and Joseph. Thank you for being on the call. And uh, once again, Jimmy, you should have a round table of all the ones you have on this week for the next, for the next round table. I think that'll be a, a fantastic show if you do it like that. Uh, yeah, we should. And then uh, I'll charge 100 bucks, 100 bucks a head, and I'll split it with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, listen, uh, Joseph, I, I want to ask this question concerning about is our government very much involved in the Black Knight Satellite Project? Oh, we didn't even get oh, into wow. that. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I honestly, 
Let's take the the truthfulness of, of the Black Knight story as a given. For those who don't know what it is, the Black Knight satellite is a satellite that supposedly was detected by the United States and the Soviet Union in the late 50s or early 60s that was in a polar orbit which neither country at that time had been able to achieve, and that was a fairly enormous satellite. In other words, way beyond the boosting capacity of either country at the time to put up there. Still is. I mean, it's like 15 yeah. tons or something crazy. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a fairly large uh, object, whatever it is, if it's there. And I, I'm going to say for the sake of argument that it is. I rather suspect that if that's the case, um, caller that that the united states is not involved uh if if any human entity or agency is involved i think it would be this uh kind of nascent breakaway group um and incidentally i think this breakaway group uh, i have a friend walter bosley that's done an interesting analysis of the 19th century airship mystery in this respect um i i think that it goes back to the 19th century in in terms of a human breakaway group um so whatever they may have been able to achieve i don't know but if it's not human then then we're looking at something different in terms of possibility we might be looking at a, a monitoring system of some sort that you know may have been put there by whoever was involved in this cosmic war as part of their their treaty monitoring apparatus so to speak so yeah i can go either way on it thank you for the call captain all right thank you guys yeah thank you i i want to stay on the black knight uh satellite for for a second if you don't mind joseph sure it, it because what when we look at i like the black and white view of this when we look at uh this there was uh Oh man, the calls. I okay. The calls are backing up. Let's just go. Let's just. I tried to talk some more. I can't do it. Hi, you live. On, <laughs> you live on Faded Black. Say hi to Joseph Farrell. Hi, Joe. How you doing? Hi, Jimmy. Um, I, you know, I, I, there's so many things out there about the secret space program that what I wanted to ask you, Joe, from your research, um, you know, and from what Gary said and what Richard Dolan says, there these craft are probably mostly what these big tubular cigar cigar shaped kind of aircraft carrier things mm -hmm. and if if so i wanted to ask you how did they how did they get them up there i mean where were they built is there any evidence for the, were they built at area 51 and how did they get them up without us seeing them and mm -hmm. i guess the final question would be what are they doing besides going to other planets are they patrolling indeed because there are some hostile other societies that are trying to attack earth well that's a great question and i'm i'm really glad that you put it uh because I'm one of those that sees no logical connection between size and the ability of humans to build it. Uh, I hear oftentimes that people that have seen these big triangular UFOs say something to the effect, well, those are just too big for anybody human to have manufactured it, much less get them up there. Uh, and the reason I say that is if you look, for example, you can Google Boeing's big hangars in, in, in Seattle, Washington, and these are just enormous structures. And I really think that if you put your engineering thinking cap on for just a few seconds, you could literally design a kind of collapsible, uh, dirigible-like um, craft you know fill it with helium and and uncollapse it have all the girders fall into place charge it electromagnetically with with charge differentials on leading and, and following edges and so on and so forth and you've got a kind of a simple heavier than air electrogravitic craft that you can literally take out anywhere and fill up with with the gas and off you go uh, obviously that has its limits I mean to a certain extent when you start getting into just gigantic aircraft it would it would become difficult for people to keep this a secret so no I don't necessarily see size in some of these cases as necessarily indicating ET and again we have to go back to, to this neglected thing in in ufology called the 19th century airship mystery clearly you're dealing with uh, I think a phenomenon that is human in origin, that clearly is being reported all over this country and in some cases in Europe, 
uh, that is dealing with some sort of exotic technology for the day that isn't simply a Zeppelin. Let, let's just be frank. Mm -hmm. So this this idea of a breakaway group has been around for a while, and and I look, I, I'm kind of a skeptic. When when I look at stuff, I I try and figure out is it necessary that we leap immediately to the ET conclusion, or can we at least rationalize some sort of putative engineering behind what we're looking at and i think if you take that approach then a lot of these things point more to a to a breakaway civilization sort of hypothesis like richard dolan has been maintaining well then that's what the, the second part of my question was why uh -huh. build them so big are they aircraft carrier type things strictly for defense from perhaps uh, otherworldly civilizations are they mining uh, on on Mars? Are they mining right. on Venus? I mean, why make them so large and so conspicuous? And why have office so many officers? If Gary McKinnon's uh, evidence is true, that there are what thirty five ships? Yeah, yeah. I, I think your I think your your reasoning there is sound. You know, why build them so big? Well, the the obvious thing that comes to mind is cargo transport of some sort, be it other you know smaller craft or be it you know something that you're mining off planet and bringing back, or or transporting from this planet elsewhere. You know, that's the other possibility that we have to look at. Is there actual okay. commerce going on? So yeah, I think that's a possibility. Thank you for the call. Yeah, because what. Well, Jimmy, if I could say, there are companies like Bechtel that do a lot of erections, underground stuff. Uh, right. You know, it would it would seem to me, even the way they run their companies, I mean, I tried to get a job there once, and they were noted for being very strict and and you know it just it it just doesn't fit in it's like they had something else going on where they didn't even need you as an employee if you weren't a certain type of person that they wanted which hit me as a very militaristic type of organization okay I, again thank you for the call dino and and uh, act, yeah thank you for the call um it he brings up a very, very, very good point that you touched upon, Joseph, which is these huge Death Star black triangles, right? Some of them are, right. you know, a mile wide, but right. they're, they're always 30 miles an hour. Right? Yeah. You don't hear about them going at Mach 6. Right. It's right. always this ultra, ultra slow speed, and uh, which which leans towards a terrestrial uh, origin and not necessarily, I mean, in my eye, I don't know, but that, that it could, what if it is that, uh, that anti-gravity, like you had just pointed out was say helium, you know, that's, that's a really, really, really good point. And I, I never really thought about it like that. Maybe that's well, why they only move 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. They're not moving at, you know, the speed of sound. Well, yeah, you're using you're using you know lighter than air gases to to get the thing up there, and you know once it's up to a sufficient altitude, you you turn on your your capacitors or whatever you've got for for your uh, charge differential creation, and off they go. I've heard reports of these triangular aircraft hovering very slowly, and then zip, you know, off they go. Um, so, but again, I, I think that it's not entirely beyond the, the bounds of, of possible human engineering and science, um, that we're looking at something human, not necessarily extraterrestrial. But in other cases, you know, you've got some of those videos from the space shuttle that, that NASA or other people have found, and there you're dealing with such incredible stuff that, yeah, the case the case changes again and it could be that you're looking at at one end of transactions you know i think he's right the size of these things indicates that something is being transported be it military assets mining resources what have you people people yeah exactly people uh, now uh, back to the black knight satellite what what i find interesting is is that uh, Tesla talked about it, uh, made uh, communication with it, or heard something. Uh, there was another astronomer in, in Holland, I believe, uh, somewhere in the Netherlands that had uh, that traced it and, and, and found a code. 
what well, these stories are there, but then it was it was actually picked up on radar, seen through telescopes in the nineteen uh, late nineteen fifties. Uh, newspaper articles were written, and the contact was made. And then you have all of that part of it in the official side of things, and then you have Pepsi <laughs> doing this ten minute movie on it. Have you seen yeah. it? Have you seen the movie? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, go and watch it. And then they use Usher, of all people, right, the Illuminati spokesman. They use Usher to narrate and represent this thing. Now, at the beginning of the Pepsi Black Knight movie, and after the show tonight, Joseph, go and watch it. I swear to you, I I, I know you're going to call me tomorrow and go, Church, what the hell? Okay. (laughs) So go and watch it because at the beginning of the Pepsi movie, They make these statements. Everything that you are about to see is true. This is fact. I'm paraphrasing here. This is fact. Tesla made contact. This made contact. All the facts of the Black Knight satellite are presented in the beginning of this 10-minute short film as being fact. Now, what is the message here? Why is Pepsi doing it? Why invest this money? It, it, It could be some crazy commercial right for advertising for pepsi i don't know but why use the black knight satellite as a tool and then tie in every conspiracy theory about the the black knight satellite and say that it's fact because people believe pepsi Mm -hmm. people believe usher and if usher is involved then it must be true and that is what's nuts for me about the black knight satellite well, I think they're driving the meme. Um, it's not just Pepsi doing it. If you look back, I was told, I didn't watch it myself, but I was told that Boeing and other companies were, were running very interesting commercials during the last Super Bowl. Yes, they were. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they appear to be driving the meme for a very deliberate reason into the public consciousness. The only thing I would would caution people about is don't be too ready to leap onto the ET bandwagon, and here's why. If you've got exotic technologies like that, then it becomes possible to use them in a kind of a false flag scenario. And the reason I'm mentioning that is if you go back to my book, um, Saucers, Swastikas, and PsyOps, the first thing in the historical record that I know of, where you have the idea of using that kind of exotic technology in that sort of psychological warfare covert operations mode, Mm -hmm. was proposed by SS Lieutenant Colonel Otto Scorzani after World War II. So it's very interesting to me that you now have these, these big corporations driving this meme. So I, you know, I just caution people, don't be too ready to believe the explanations that they're telling you that's behind this. Just look at it with, uh, you know, a good jaundiced skeptical eye. You know, you know, the other PSYOP during the Super Bowl that was ET related, huh. you didn't mention it. Giorgio oh. Sukalos doing the Taco Bell ad. Oh, yes, that's right. I forgot all about. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, they're driving the meme, you know, for very deliberate reasons. Yeah, that's interesting. Sorry, Giorgio. You know, I'm just poking at you, man. (laughs) Just poking at you. Um, uh, Phone lines are open. 323-825-5045. I don't even know my own phone numbers here. Um, But there's another thing that I wanted to mention when you were talking about Uh, the Boeing hangars and where this could be launched from. Mm -hmm. I always think about Antarctica. Oh, yeah. I I, I really do because it is completely cordoned off. You know, the flat earthers will say that, you know, well, uh, I didn't go there. I didn't say that. I apologize to all of the flat earthers out there. But that's an area that we know nothing about. Right. And if if there is going to be something covert and easy, it would be there. And apparently it's been developed anyway for a long time. 
Right. Well, you'd have any number of, of remote areas in the world, Diego Garcia, uh, southern Argentina. You know, there's lots of places. Just look at all the empty space in this country, you know, let alone the rest of the world. So, yeah, you know, there's there's any number of places you could put something like that up into the air. Siberia. Hi. Siberia, yeah. Yeah. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Joseph Farrell. Hi, Joseph. This is Mark from Oregon, Jimmy. Hey, Mark. Um, so, uh, you've, I know you've thought a lot, Joseph, about where this goes in terms of a breakaway civilization. But once, once you have the means to produce energy and you have machines doing most of the production, then you don't need humans uh, so much to do manual labor. And and you sort of shake the very foundations of, of the, the the Luther work ethic that we've all you know that Christianity has brought down to us in Western civilization, mm-hmm. and you also shake the basis of capitalism, maybe mm-hmm. even bring it to its knees. And if if you couple that with <clears throat> all of these uh, biochemists and and aging doctors who come up missing or dead when they're about to disclose something Mm -hmm. because I thoroughly believe they've stopped the aging process myself, then uh, uh, a four-year university degree becomes uh, a worthless piece of paper, Mm -hmm. a 50-year diploma. Mm -hmm. And and I just wondered uh, what your thoughts were about those things. Well, I think you're right. Um, I think what we need to start getting into our minds when we talk about breakaway civilization is that we're not just simply talking about a civilization with access to advanced propulsion technologies or weapons technologies, but also to advanced medical technologies. I mean, look at the power elite in the world. Look at Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, for crying out loud. You know, she still looks like she's in her 60s. Um, you look at you look at these people, and it strongly suggests that they they have access to some hidden medical or perhaps even genetic technologies. So I think you're looking when you say breakaway civilization. You know, I think in terms of the whole package. I'm not thinking just in terms of emulating UFO performance, but I'm also thinking in terms of longevity technologies, um, cancer cures things of this sort, uh, you know, computing processing that is very, very different from from what we have on our desks, <laughs> um, communications technologies and so on. I think this is, this is a broad, across-the-board thing. After all, <clears throat> trillions of dollars over several decades is going to buy you an awful lot of technology, and there's no reason to confine it to physics. Thank you for the call, Mark. Brilliant. Absolutely Thank brilliant. Thank you so much. You know, uh, t- Queen Elizabeth was born in like 1602. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's such an I, I, I She looks the same now today in 2016 than she did like in 1905. Yeah. I, it's amazing to me. And she's yeah. going to outlive her kids. They've been wanting the throne now for 45 <laughs> years. <laughs> I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. No, I, I know you're not wrong. You know, there there is something very weird there. You know, her, Prince Philip, um, you know, Queen Victoria was very long-lived. And, uh, you know, King Edward VII, I, I'm certain, was by the time he did ascend the throne, he was, you know, a fairly old man, didn't have his mother's genes. Um, but, yeah, I, you look at these people and you just have to think that they've got access to something that that the rest of us don't. And here's one big clue. You look at their diet, and guess what? They're not eating GMOs. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to turn out, you know, David Icke's going to be right. <laughs> yeah. She eats flies. <laughs> you know, it's going to be something crazy. But, you know, we've been waiting. I mean, I'm 52. 
and we I have been looking at the queen now for 52 years, and I'm sorry, she looks exactly the same now as she did yeah. when I was five. Yeah, she she hasn't aged really, as far as I can tell, since since Prime Minister Thatcher. You know, so who, who came uh, and went, by the who way? Who came and went, by the way? Yes, <laughs> fascinating. Now, um, when uh, I want to, I, I, I kind of want to leave on this, but we you can hang on. Uh, we there's a lot more to talk about. If you want to go into some overtime, we can. Sure. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, Egypt because I think uh, it it is one of the most important. Uh, things that we have on planet Earth. And I, I, my imagination says this, 50,000 years from now, it's going to be the last thing standing once again, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be the last thing here. And, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not making light of it. I think it is much older than, than it is. It, it was there when the pharaohs moved into town, Upper and Lower Egypt joined, the yeah. dynasties were created, they inherited yes. the, the pyramids. Who do, yes. you, who do you think built them? I know you've talked about this for, for years, but... Well, you have to make a distinction between the Giza complex and, and, and basically three layers of construction that are definitely present there at the Giza complex and then the rest of the, of, of the Egyptian pyramids. There's no doubt that the Egyptians themselves did build things like Dashur and Saqqara and so on and so forth. But the Giza compound is different in that you see clearly three layers of construction you see you see the great pyramid which is by any stretch of the imagination one of the most flawlessly executed buildings in the world uh, it does have flaws in it, but it is, for such a colossal structure, having all of the inbuilt um, mathematical analogs, as it were, of, of local celestial space and geodetic measures and so on and so forth, this is a humongously complex structure that the Egyptians, even at the height of their, their pyramid-building powers, simply could not emulate or duplicate. And, so that is, to did, me, a very, very old stratum of, well, of construction. And, and didn't duplicate. And didn't duplicate, exactly. So to me, the Great Pyramid, you know, I've always thought that the pyramid, particularly given Herodotus's statement about the watermark halfway up the pyramid when it had its casing stones on, well, that would put the structure back into antediluvian times which most people date to around the year 10,000 BC, which of course is long before the actual rise of dynastic Egypt. Um, then you've got a second layer of construction represented by the second big pyramid at Giza and, and the valley temples and the Sphinx, which, you know, John Anthony West and Schwaller de Lubitsch and, and Robert Schock always thought was a very old structure given the water erosion that's evident on it. And, you know, if you follow Schock's research, that would date it to the um, subpluvial period, about 8,000 B.C., and there are now some scientists even challenging that date and pushing the Sphinx back 800,000 years B.C. And if that's the case, then that would mean the Great Pyramid is even older than that. So, yeah, I think you've got three layers of construction there. As to who built it, my best guess, Jimmy, is that this is a, a monument, a leftover, a machine of whatever very high civilization existed on this planet long before the civilizations of, of classical antiquity. Um, I, I think the view of, of Alan Alford and, and people like this is essentially correct, that the Egyptians came and, and found that site, so to speak. And incidentally, when you look at it very carefully, the same is said by the Aztecs of Teotihuacan in Mexico. Those pyramids, they say, were there, they, they were built by the gods, and they were simply abandoned, and, you know, we found them. Same thing with Puma Punku. Same thing with Puma Punku. Yeah, exactly. So you're looking at, you're looking at very, very old, old structures on, on this planet that again, challenge the basic academic dating of things. There's something else behind all of these civilizations building all of these things. 
and for whatever purpose we don't know. It is clear, I think, that they're building them on a planetary scale, on a planetary grid. In other words, it's, it's as if they're trying to transform the planet itself into some sort of machine. And if you're thinking along those lines, then that means, yeah, you're dealing with, with a society and a civilization that's thinking in terms of planetary-scaled physics. You're thinking in terms, in other words, of, of a Kardashev Class I type of civilization. So, yeah, these things, I think, Jimmy, are just very, very, very old. You want to you want to hang on uh, for sure. a little overtime? All right, let's do that. Uh, let's take a quick break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Joseph P. Farrell. And I'll keep the phone lines open for everybody. 323-825-5045. More with Joseph Farrell when we come back. This is Fade to Black. Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Angioprim can clean blocked arteries and improve blood flow in all parts of your body. Angioprim is liquid oral chelation. It's not new science. 50 years of research has gone into chelation and now there's Angioprim. Easy, simple, liquid oral chelation. You take it with juice before breakfast and forget about it. Angioprim works fast, unlike old-fashioned chelation that takes hours. The first thing Angioprim users say is they have more energy, more strength, more endurance. Increased circulation and blood flow will make all your body parts work better. Log on now at angioprim.com to get more information on how you can get started and start feeling better and doing more. Lots more. Talk to a trained Angioprim consultant or go to angioprim.com for help. Call Angioprim toll free at 877-882-7221. That's Angioprim at 877-882-7221. Get the facts about Angioprim. Begin living the life you want, doing the things you used to do again with Angioprim. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tappy. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back to Fade to Black. Doing a little overtime tonight with Joseph P. Farrell. And right before the break, we were starting to get into Giza and the construction of the pyramids. And and Joseph, this is this is man, I'm I am such a drunk, polluted brain. But <laughs> but this is this is how this is how my brain works. Rita and I own a nice house not a mansion i don't mean it like that but what i mean it's new right nice construction and it is built facing due east right 
Okay. Uh North side of the house faces due north. It is supposed to be perfect. And I can guarantee you, if I went out there with some lasers, right, and started to check this out, we're we're off killed. (laughs) Right. right. It's going to be off by degrees. It's going to be off by inches. It's probably not plumb. It's probably not level. With all of the technology that we have today, when you go out and you build a house uh, on a site today where you have lasers and you have GPS and you have the abilities to do things, um, it, there's no way. You, you could probably get it perfect, but you would spend way too much money. And, and why would you? Right. right, exactly. But they did. <laughs> that, right. It is true north. It is plumb. It is level. And it is the frigging biggest thing, heaviest, gnarliest thing on planet Earth. That is where I I start to raise all of the red flags when we're talking about giving Stone Age man some credit here. Right. Right. Well, the structure is, as you say, it's it's so perfectly constructed. And this this to me is the biggest argument for the fact that this is the product of a very high civilization. And I I think that once you start looking at the structure with an engineer's eyes, you have to conclude that all of this is for a purpose other than burying a pharaoh. Right, a monument. Right, exactly. Um, You don't need that kind of optical precision unless you're building a machine of some sort. You wouldn't spend that amount of money unless you're building a machine. The, The real question is, what kind of machine is it? And, you know, my argument all along has been that when you look at all of the the redundancies built into the structure, dimensional analogs of local celestial space, what you're looking at is a harmonic oscillator designed somehow to tap into all of the energy of local celestial space. And then the question becomes, well, why would you need all of that energy? And the answer is, well, there's, you certainly could use it for power, but you could also use all of that energy for destructive purposes, which has been my hypothesis all along, that, that this has all the hallmarks of enormous expenditure of precision engineering, of the ability to tap potentially into to the local structured potential, and that has all the hallmarks of a weapon. And when you look at some of the ancient texts, I, I think it becomes clear that they they themselves considered these things somehow to be long to the category of the weapons of the gods. You know, the, the Sumerian texts, the Akkadian texts refer to the mountains of the gods, the acres. Well, acre is the same word for pyramid as it is for mountain, and incidentally can also stand for a planet. So, uh, you know, all the clues are there to suggest both in terms of of the actual engineering of the structure and then in terms of of textual references to those types of structures. And that ties into the idea of the cosmic war. Yeah, I think you're looking very possibly at leftovers from that war. Uh, These are hardened structures, as you've pointed out. Egypt will still be there in 50,000 years. Well, what kind of structure survives or is designed to survive for that long? And and the thing that pops into my head, well, it's a hardened military compound is what it is. And, you know, you see similar things on Mars. And again, why are they there? Why such monumental architecture? Is it simply um, because you want to build a monument? Well, I highly doubt it. Um, and, 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 and apparently the same. Yeah, yeah. The same types of mathematics, the same types of of, of analogs to, to dimensional analogs of, of local celestial space. The same thing repeated over and over. So there's, to my mind, Jimmy, what all of this is pointing to is that they, they perhaps knew principles of physics that we're only now just beginning to, to understand. Uh, so we're not back at the same pitch of development as we were, you know, when, whenever, whatever humans or anybody else built those structures. Uh, we're just, we're just beginning to get there.
I'll tell you something fascinating. In uh, in France, there's an open pit mine, right? Yeah, Huge. yes. And it's the same size inverted as the pyramid. If, you know, you turn it upside, you know, it's a hole in the ground, right? Yep, yep. And all they wanted to do was fill it up with rocks, right? Yeah. Just yeah. fill it up. That's not construct something. Not construct something to do north or true north. Not any of that. Not carve something. Just fill it up with garbage, rubble, and rock. Right? Yeah. Dump trucks 24 hours a day. Guess how long it took? Oh, I, I can imagine. 20 years. I can believe it. Yeah. And they did. I can believe it. And they didn't build a thing. <laughs> no, they were just dumping stuff in it. <laughs> they were just yeah. dumping stuff in it. Now, I'm sorry. That's when I just I just step back and go, come on, you got to stop uh, uh, feeding this BS. There is something else much more phenomenal and beautiful here. And and the the amnesia that that humanity has, which is very quick. We you know, yeah, it, it, you could you could have a, a restaurant that goes out of business. Right. You take the sign down. And and you don't know what kind of restaurant it is, right? Chinese, Mexican, American, steakhouse, whatever. You just pull the sign down, let it sit there for 20 years, and then go up to a neighbor and go, hey, what was that? I don't know. Don't remember. Yep. Right? Yep. The same thing happened in Giza. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Yeah, the same uh, thing. That w when when Napoleon got there, when the Persians got there, the Greeks get there, you know, they look and they're, hey, you know, what What are those? Don't know. Really? Who built? I don't know. Uh, but uh, we've been taking rocks off of it for a while, and we built this nice church over here. But I, I don't know. I don't know uh, what those are. And that's what's amazing. And uh, hieroglyphics, the Egyptian language, after after Cleopatra and after everything fell apart, nobody f remembered how to read hieroglyphics. Exactly. You know, exactly. it, that amnesia comes in really, really quick. And that when we apply that back to Giza, I'm sorry that you, you don't have the answers. Egyptologists, it's fakery. It's oh, it fakery. is. I, 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 the idea that, you know, you went to all of this expenditure to build a tomb for a pharaoh when no pharaoh was ever found in the thing. And additionally, when the few hieroglyphics that are in it are, are discovered under such extraordinarily suspicious circumstances, and the hieroglyphs contain egregious, simple errors that no Egyptian would have made in their right mind. Yeah, the hieroglyphics wouldn't be, you know, if I'm going to put a sign on my house, I put it on the front of the house. I don't put it up in my attic Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's impossible to reach unless you dynamite your way in. That's right. You know, and 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 <laughs> I, I, Cheops, why his name isn't on the side of that sarcophagus in the most simplistic ways, right? That's right. why. Why isn't his name there? I mean, it, 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 why is the entire thing blank? I'm sorry. I know it sounds stupid. It sounds so elemental, but it's the real truth. If yeah. I'm a king and I'm building something like that, I'm plastering my name all over it. I built it for me to begin with. And they, right. they didn't have a problem putting their names on 40-foot statues in Luxor. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And Dendera, you know, exactly. there, there's plenty of writing all over the Valley of the Kings. All of those tombs are certainly advertised. Right. You know right. exactly who was there and, and what, when and where. But the, the biggest and the best, there's nothing there. I have an issue. But but uh, the Orthodox Egyptologist doesn't care and they want to dismiss that. I, again, I think a lot of that, Jimmy, is they know something else about the whole thing, and they've got to keep the Egyptology myth about the whole compound going. Um, I, to this day, I, I've, I've just never been able to buy the idea that, that Harold Weiss dynamites his way into the relieving chambers, and lo and behold, magnificently finds carved you know in red ink with poor poorly executed hieroglyphs which he doesn't let anyone see 
for you know a couple of days and he is quietly going back and forth between his tent and the pyramid that whole thing smacks to me of of a planted discovery a forgery um i i just don't buy the idea that those hieroglyphs that are in the great pyramid are authentic and it's very interesting that the egyptian department of antiquities particularly under zali hawas absolutely persisted insistently that no one be able to carbon date the ink on those hieroglyphs yeah exactly and oh hey listen i want to thank you for an absolutely amazing discussion tonight and show sure before i let you go what are you doing now what's the next book are you speaking uh i have a book actually two books coming out uh later this year one is called rotten to the common core it's about the common core um thing in education and it seems unrelated to my other books but it i can assure you is related uh then i have a book coming out shortly i think probably within the next month to a month and a half called hidden finance rogue networks secret sorcery 9 11 the fascist international so um that book should be coming out, I, I would imagine, by the end of April. Well, Rest of the year, I'm going to probably speak at a couple of conferences and do some research and writing. And everything is over at Giza Death Star? Yeah, except the new books. The new books aren't up in my web store. They're on Amazon for pre-order. I don't, I don't actually put them on my web store until they're actually available. Okay, I got you. Well, I look forward to uh, getting you back on when the books are released, and uh, we'll pick everything up where we left off tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me back on, Jimmy. You got it. Joseph P. Farrell, everybody. Thank you so much. And one of the things that, uh, that I always say after I have a guest like Joseph on the show, uh, which is pretty much every single night, is I learn something. And that's the whole point of this, is if I'm learning, you are learning right along with me. I can't imagine... You know, uh, well, first off, I do know how spoiled you guys are. But if I was on the other side of the speakers here and I'm, you know, in my dark bedroom somewhere in the Midwest in the middle of the night listening to this show, I would just be like, holy crap, this is the best. And that's exactly why I do this show. I just put myself in your shoes. And that's, man, Joseph Farrell. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Now, tomorrow night, Richard Dolan right here for day three of our Breakaway Civilizations Secret Space Program Week. Okay, now, you can go to Joseph's website. If you go over to JimmyChurchRadio.com, just click on his name, Giza Death Star. Everything is there. He's got a bunch of really cool videos. You can go check those out. All of his books are there. And uh, really great reading. It's a great website. All right. Now, I watched a a couple of calls just uh, click through and go away. I'll go ahead and I'll open up the phone lines for the last five minutes. 323-825-5045. Thank you, Joseph P. Farrell. Man. All right. Here we go. Jonathan, a 184-year-old tortoise that lives on the volcanic island of St. Helena, is thought to be the world's oldest living land creature. Now, as of a few days ago, are you ready? He may have been the dirtiest. He has never taken a bath. (laughs) Now, he's 184 years old. He can barely walk. He's the oldest living thing on planet Earth. Right? Land creature, that is. And he has never taken a bath. Now, since the remote British island territory will receive a royal visitor in May, that's right, right? The island's vet decided to scrub nearly two centuries worth of dirt and grime and filth off of his shell using (laughs) a loofah (laughs) and surgical soap. I know you think I'm making this up, but this is true. The entire cleanup of Jonathan took around an hour. (laughs) 
Uh, and you know what? When I get out of the shower in the morning, because I'm 52, right? When I go into the shower, I look one way. When I come out of the shower, I look a little younger. I look a little better. Clean that grime off, little shampoo, right? Scrub down, little loofah action. But not Jonathan. Nah, he didn't look that much different. But he's paler. And now you can see the rings on his shell have completely disappeared. It's an amazing story and amazing photographs. But I'll tell you this much. He walked a little more upright, and the women, the women were coming and talking. That's what I'm talking about. Jonathan, 184 years old, never had a bath. Man. All right. Okay, this is something that I want all of you to uh, take out your pen, write this down, and take some notes. This is really important stuff here. People who display frequent bouts of extreme, impulsive anger, such as road rage, okay? And I know you guys all know somebody, right? Impulsive anger, road rage. Those people are more than twice as likely to be infected with a common parasite than are individuals who do not exhibit such explosive behavior. Now, this is according to a new study, and the findings that were reported in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry suggest that the parasite infection of toxoplasmosis could lead to increased aggressiveness and associated mental illness in some people. People who reported repeatedly fly off the handle with little provocation and who overreact to stress are often diagnosed with a condition known as intermittent, intermittent explosive disorder. The researchers have found via blood test that individuals diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder were more than twice as likely to test positive for toxoplasmosis and its exposure compared to healthy people with no such prior diagnosis. The study involved 358 adult subjects. Now, are you as creeped out as I am? I went on and I checked this out a little bit further. And like I said, take your pen out and write this down. Toxo, T-O-X-O, plasmosis, P-L-A-S-M-O-S-I-S. Toxoplasmosis. Is it, is it in the brain? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you have that road rage guy? Do you have a parasite in your body that is that is infecting your brain? Think about that. Is that about the creepiest thing ever? And it looks like it may be true. Now, <clears throat> meteorites are coming to an auction house near you next month. Christie's London has organized a sale of over 83 space rocks at their South Kensington location, which are expected to go for between $3.81 million at around April 20th. The most expensive of the bunch, described as the world's largest oriented meteorite, with extraterrestrial gemstones, and it's huge, by the way, is estimated at somewhere between $700,000 and $1.1 million. Check this out. This thing weighs 1,433 pounds. It's huge. And they're expecting to get about $1.1 million for it. It's full of of gemstones. Man, I wish I had a spare mill right now. I would do it. One of the I'm a big watch guy. 
and I don't have yet. I'm gonna get one. I don't have a watch with the meteor meteorite face on it. It's it's the trend right now in watches, right, to have a a meteorite face, and they look good. There, some of them get really, really, really expensive. But man, if I had a million bucks, I'd buy this thing, and I'd chop it apart. <laughs> I wouldn't have it, you know, displayed in my living room. Also on view is the Valera meteorite, which fell in Trujillo, Venezuela in 1972. And why is this a famous stone? Because it's the only meteorite on record that fell from space and killed someone. It killed a cow. (laughs) That's right. This guy is on auction, and it's expected to fetch between $5,000 $5,000 and $8,000. The killer meteorite, by the way, was last sold at Bonhams in 2007 for $1,553. A romantic encounter with Captain Kirk, William Shatner, allegedly had in 1956, is going to cost him some big money in 2016. It's starting to play out right now, and the story is crazy. Peter Sloan claims that, well, his, his, his name is also Peter Shatner, by the way. Peter Sloan claims that Captain Kirk is his father and that he has now filed a $170 million lawsuit accusing Shatner of libel, defamation, and slander. Why would he do that to his dad? It's a crazy story. He's also demanding that Shatner consent to a paternity test and is asking for a jury trial. I'm not making this up. Sloan is a 59-year-old radio host in Florida. And he says that Shatner got his mother, actress Kathy McNeil, pregnant in Toronto. He says that McNeil put him up for adoption after uh, days after he was born and never told Shatner that they have conceived a child. Now, Sloan, who now goes by the name of his radio name is uh, is Peter Shatner, says that he has been confronting Shatner over the years and that his representatives and he has approached Shatner and they have they have come to him going, look, you know what? You know, he's old. He doesn't need this right now in his life. Just chill out. Reactions like that to, dude, he's not your father. Right? And to just go away. He doesn't want to talk to you about it. The story gets even more complicated than that. But it's about to play out in trial. He's asking for the lawsuit has been brought forward and he doesn't want a settlement. He doesn't want anything. He wants a jury to settle this. It's getting ready to uh, get very interesting. Now, check this out Japanese researchers have built a prototype of an electric fork that imitates the flavor of salt. Yes, so you don't have to consume any salt. No guilt. The fork, developed by researchers under the lead of Hiromi Nakamura at Rekimoto Lab at the University of Tokyo, generates a salty taste by stimulating the tongue with electricity. The device draws on an electric test for taste, which is used to determine if a taste cell of a tongue is dead or alive and exploits the fact that a tongue registers salty or sour flavor when electricity is applied to it. The cutlery is powered by a rechargeable battery and its electric circuit is activated when the user presses a button on the handle, kind of like a vape. The prototype costs less than $18 to produce. Now, you have to get your own interchangeable fork that goes in and plugs in to the end. I'm not making this up. There are, so far, three degrees of saltiness from which to choose. This is Fade to Black. I want to thank Joseph P. Farrell for day two of our secret space program. Breakaway Civilization Special Stars pressing buttons. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. 
Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA The Planet. Thank you to everyone that called in tonight. Thank you, Joseph P. Farrell. Tomorrow night, Richard Dolan, right here, day three. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2016 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter, at J Church Radio. I want everybody to be safe. Go Bagley Tepe.